make sure that everyone's aware of everything uh, that the board members have received and that's in the packet. Um, you've received on your um, on your desks this evening a letter um, from Michael Mahoney regarding the request of Sarah Hathaway Merrill, which will come up under that business. You've also received a packet on the Sarah Hathaway Merrill request at 51 Cottage Farms Road, including the tax map um, and so forth, with a uh, letter uh, from the undersigned. Uh, there's a notice of conditional use uh, decision for, for our use when we make a decision. There's an application for conditional use from Sarah Hathaway Merrill. An there's more of the application. There's a copy of uh, page six of article one dealing with home business, uh, the ordinance. Several pages of that. Uh, there's a copy of Sarah Hathaway Merrill's um, license in physical therapy and certification certificate and a map of the property along with pictures for that case. On the second case, you received two mailings, one with the packet that came from this office and one that came from, um, from those submitting the appeal. Uh, Anthony and Julie Armstrong. Uh, from the board office, from this office, you received an administrative appeal forum, the draft notice of conditional use decision, a memo from Bruce Smith um, dealing with the administrative appeal regarding, uh, regarding the uh, grievance and the responses. There's a copy of the building permit, which was granted. And Bruce, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that's what was, no, there's more. Where is it? You received more, and I think that I've um, misshuffled it. Um, but I will go on to outline um, and Bruce, you could correct us afterwards of other communications. Um, there, uh, in the packet that was received, uh, that was sent on June 22nd from the Armstrongs to the zoning board, uh, there's a cover letter and there's um, the um, memo um, outlining the appeal. There's a document list um, which outlines the 21 exhibits and there are the attached exhibits which include uh, some case law, some definitions, some photos, maps, an affidavit from James Cusack, some additional photos and maps and definitions, property assessment records. These are all itemized in that, but I wanted to make sure that everyone has all of these. Um, going through with a copy of the um, February 1st administrative appeal for the building permit number, which is Exhibit 19, and then an additional uh, set of uh, map, as well as another copy of the building permit, which had already been uh, given. Um, is there anything, Bruce, because there were a few things that, that were um, might have been misplaced on my desk, but is there anything else on that case that I'm haven't yet outlined? I believe you've covered it all. Okay. I Good. do have a copy of the, um, or the board of the actual administrative appeal from February 1st, if, if, it, if the board needs a copy of that to get into the, the context of the case. Okay. Good. And then on the third case, which is um, uh, the variance appeal of Donald Head and Karen Zand. You received copies of notice of the variance decision, the draft, as well as notice of appeal and request for variance, several photos of the property. Calculations for the volume. An inspection of the premises where it says at the top, not a boundary survey some maps of the property, plot plan, 
a letter from Sterling Insect One Control, a letter from uh, Daniel and Eleanor Redmond, a letter from uh, Penny and Alan Barthelman, and a letter from Robert Cloutier, Robert and Leanne Cloutier on that. Then in communications, and I um, bear your indulgence to make sure that everyone has all pieces of information. Uh, the, there are some communications. First, a letter from Mike Hill dated June 7th to Bruce Smith regarding um, submission of, of, uh, of copies of the application and deadlines and so forth with um, the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals attached. There's also a copy of the application for administrative appeal and two zoning, three zoning bulletin um, issues for board education. I believe that that completes everything that people should have. Is there anything, are there any questions about that before we begin? Okay, there being none. I, excuse me, on the first case at uh, Merrill, did you mention the one I just passed out uh, on the yes. for objections? Yes, it did. Okay, I do have one copy of, of uh, and I'll pass it down to you. I don't know why they didn't copy it for everybody, but it should be entered in the record. I'll need that back. This is on um, this first case? Yeah, I have one copy to read it into the record. That way everybody wouldn't have to read it. Thank you. Anything else? Well then, let's turn to the first item of new business then, which is to hear the request of Sarah Hathaway Merrill, 51 Cottage Farms Road, tax map U01, lot 29, for a conditional use permit to operate a home business, specifically a physical therapy, manual therapy, and sports massage business. Um, I'd first like to ask our code enforcement officer, um, Bruce Smith, to just give us a very short overview of, um, of the facts of, of what has happened with this uh, case so far, and then we'll have the um, um, Sarah Hathaway Merrill or her representative come speak before the board. Uh, 51 Cottage Farms Road is in the residential C district, which, which allows uh, home businesses to exist with approval as a conditional use permit through the Board of Appeals. Uh, the applicant seeking to do a home business, specifically what you said, which was a, which was a uh, uh, physical therapy, manual therapy, and sports massage business. Um, the rest speaks for itself. Okay. Is uh, someone here to speak to this? Yes. yes. Great. Please come to the microphone, identify yourself for the record, and then let's, let's hear about your request. Okay. I'm Sarah Hathaway Merrill, and I'm a physical therapist. Um, I've been licensed as a physical therapist for 12 years, um, received my undergraduate degree at the University of Vermont, my graduate degree at the University of Southern California. I'm currently employed 32 hours per week at Scarborough Physical Therapy. Um, what I'm requesting the board for approval today is uh, to have a home business where I would um, be continuing to practice physical therapy at home um, on a very limited basis. Um, there would be no usage of signs, um, no advertising, um, as far as I can see, no impact to the um, neighborhood or residential feel of, of the neighborhood because because that's something that I particularly value and, and would not want to change that kind of character in the neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, I, I don't know how much you want me to go through um, from my application, but um, my initial um, thought is that I would be seeing as few as one or two clients a week because of the amount of time that I do currently work at my uh, full-time job. Um, but should in the future my husband and I decide to have children um, and I stay home more, I'm, there might be the possibility that the business could grow to what I said was maybe four or five clients at a maximum any, any one day, maybe three days a week. Um, that's the maximum I could ever see it growing to. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, 
The traffic impact, I think, would be minimal. Uh, that is a cut through street between Mitchell and Shore, so that street gets quite a bit of traffic. Um, we, there's available off-street parking in our uh, driveway, so the streets would not need, uh, the clients would not need to park uh, on the street. Um, the pictures indicate that I included that there's, the client would have to back out of the driveway. Pictures that I gave you indicate there's great uh, sight both directions, so from a safety standpoint, that should not be an issue. Um, there would be no more than one client there at a time. Approximately maybe every one to one and a half hours. It would be during regular business hours. 7.30 perhaps the earliest person if somebody wanted to go before their work hours. Maybe 6 o'clock the latest client. Um, and I can't think of anything else to tell you, but any questions that you have, I welcome. Okay, this is the appropriate time for the board to ask a few questions, and if okay. anybody has any, they will. After they've had the question and answer period with you, then we'll turn to see if there's anyone wishing to speak in favor of this application, and then anyone wishing to speak in opposition to it. I did have one thing to add. I think one piece that maybe Bruce passed around um, that you didn't mention was that I did um, check with my immediate neighbors as to if there was any opposition and they did sign a letter saying that they did not have any opposition. Yes, people have received. Um, You're gonna enter, uh, read them into the record, the opposition and the. For the, you're suggesting read the names into the record? Well, I would suggest you read both, okay. both papers into the record. I also, uh, a verbal came to the, uh, over the phone from Ted Happen after the day who wants to be removed from the opposition list. He had a change of heart. I didn't get that in writing, but. Um. He, he wishes to be removed from the objection list. He's, right. he's number one on the objection list. Is that Is right? <laughs> At 44 Cottage? Yep. OK. Well, then, um, we can do that at, at this time. Uh, in the board packets, um, we did receive a letter uh, stating, um, dated June 6, we the undersigned are not in objection to Sarah Hathaway Merrill operating a manual therapy and sports massage business out of her home at 51 Cottage Farms Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And I'll read the names and addresses. Oren Deal, 48 Cottage Farms Road. Bryce Roberts, 55 Cottage Farms Road. Joseph Papo, 54 Cottage Farms Road. And Bonnie. Born McGarney. Bonnie McGarvey. Bonnie McGarvey, 47 Cottage Farms Road. Um, this evening um, on our desks, we also have a communication dated June 27th, uh, which is addressed to Bruce Smith, and it's regarding uh, this hearing. Dear Mr. Smith, please remove our names from any petition submitted by residents of Cottage Farms Road objecting to the above referenced request. Since signing the petition, we have reconsidered our position. Um, please contact us immediately if you have any questions. Sincerely, Michael and Michael Mahoney and Andrea Mitchell of 43 Cottage Farms Road. And then attached to that is another letter um, dated June 21st from Oliver Ellis at 38 Cottage Farms Road with an attached petition. I won't read the entirety of the letter unless I'm required to by anyone, but it basically says I was asked, I'll summarize, it was asked by several of my neighbors to circulate the enclosed petition against the request of Sarah Hathaway. And it gives reasons related to traffic, children, elderly, <coughs> and so on. Um, and there are a number of names here, and I'll just read those for the record. Petition against home business at 51 Cottage Farms Road with the undersigned strongly object to the petition for home business for physical therapy, sport massage, etc. at 51 Cottage Farms Road on the grounds that our street is now very heavily trafficked. We have many children in the area who would be subjected to the increased traffic and many walkers, both young and old, many from Woodland South, who also do not need the extra traffic. Also, this is a residential area, and therefore, if she wishes to have a business, it is our feeling that she should rent space in a business area and not decrease the value of our property by setting up a 
but setting up a business is the exact wording. Ted Heffernan's Heifer, whatever, at 44 Cottage Farms Road um, is the one that you just referred to as number one. There's another one which I can't read um, at 33 Cottage Farms Road. It looks like a Teresa or a Tova, Ron, I'm not sure. Jeffrey and Jeffrey Cummings at 33 Cottage Farms Road. Doris Ellis at 38 Cottage Farms. Oliver Ellis at 38. Mike Maher and Andy Mitchell, which are the ones that just withdrew their names in that letter at 43 Cottage. Alvin Bingham at 31 Cottage Farms Road, Louise Fox at 34 Cottage Farms, and Wayne Milliken at 34 Cottage Farms. So for the record, um, we have some proponents and some opponents. Are there, or are there questions question. from the board? Um, I'm looking at the map that you submitted with your application. Um, it appears to be the tax map for Cape Elizabeth, um, and it's showing Cottage Farms on there. The question I have is, it appears that there's only one side of the road that has housed houses on it. Is your house listed on that map? Uh, yes. Oops. I don't know if I have a copy of that. It's uh, Lot 29. Oh, okay. Yeah, Lot 29. Your number? 29. 29. Okay. Lot 29, but number 51. Correct. <laughs> if you look at the notice of public hearing that we sent out, it's, uh, it's cross hatched. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Board members have other questions. <clears throat> Are there any other questions of the applicants at this time? The, application contains names for the people that are not objecting to the your application Correct. where are they in proximity to your house which is um, 29 not right one <laughs> they're on either let's say they're lots 28 and 30 and then the two directly across which are not numbered that square lot in front of 28 and 29 and the long lot in front of 30 okay. across from 30. And if Those were the only people I asked. Okay, and the people that have submitted and said they're opposed to it, are they close to this or are they further down the street? Uh, their numbers were 31, 33, 34, 38. I would guess that they're probably five or six houses away. Maybe? Closer to shore or closer to... The numbers get... If you look at the list of Small mailings, you, you can uh -huh. cross-reference that with a map. Okay. Closer to shore. We didn't receive that. It looks like closer yeah. to shore. Oh, you, that's right. You didn't get it, but yeah. I can share it. It looks, like, with closer looks like closer to shore. Uh, could, you, could you mind repeating which neighbors were supportive? That's right here. Uh, what numbers here? Do you have? Yeah. The more immediate neighbors. Right, the ones right around me. That was all I asked because I, I guess I didn't, never having done this before, I didn't, you know, go wider or far. And probably in retrospect, for the people that were in opposition, it might have been nice for them to have a better understanding of what the business was so that they would know that it was not going to involve signs and um, not involve a large number of clients per day. I will see that the secretary supplies you with a notice for your information, that might be helpful from now on. I realize that was not in the back, but this should be helpful to you. If you'd like to, any of you'd like to look at this. What is it, Bruce? It's a notice of the public hearing uh, with a list of the, the, the butters that we, we notified. Oh, I see. Okay. Ms. Merrill, you just made mention of um, sort of educating your neighbors as to what the business was and that there would be no signs. Maybe it would be helpful for you to educate us also as to what the business is and maybe by educating us to the extent that maybe any of your neighbors who are in opposition who are here uh, would also hear it. And, and I say that in part because the letter of opposition that's been submitted to us, uh, have you seen it by the way? I have not. Um, it, it, it contains a statement that um, 
that you should probably address for the benefit of us as well as those neighbors. It says the value of our property is also at stake. Not everyone would like to purchase a home next door to a, it says a message parlor, but I assume they mean massage parlor. So if you could address that, um, I think that would be helpful. I'd love to. Um, I have to admit I take a little bit of offense to that because I'm a professional. Um, I'm a physical therapist, a licensed physical therapist by the state, as I mentioned earlier, I've been so uh, licensed physical therapist for 12 years. And um, uh, I'm married, <laughs> number one. Uh, my husband is here with me. Um, number two, just because you perform massage therapy does not mean that you are doing illicit things. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to suggest that you were by the question. Yes, well, I'm saying that the letter sort of implies that. I mean, message parlor um, somewhat implies that. Um, it, it, physical therapy involves using your hands and doing various manual therapy techniques on people. Um, the range of techniques go from everything from techniques called myofascial release, which most people don't know anything don't know about to muscle energy, to strain, counter strain, to massage. Most people understand the term massage and what that implies. Therefore, that's why I included it also because I have a very strong in interest in athletes. Um, and so it was specifically oriented towards sports massage and sports rehabilitation. It's one of my certifications. It shows I'm a strength and conditioning specialist as well. And so that's the type of clientele that I'm ideally trying to draw upon is um, my husband and I are involved in uh, biking and running and cross-country skiing and so many of our friends or associates are people such as, as that that would be seeking sort of sports massage uh, services as well as my background is primarily in orthopedics and I've worked at um, orthopedic associates in Portland and many of the physicians that I know that would refer clients to me um, our sports medicine specialists, so that's the type of work that I would be doing. Um, Thank you. Is there anything else on that? No. Okay. Thank you. You are licensed by the maybe, you are licensed by the state, right? Yes. And if you engage in any uh, salacious uh, massage uh, practices, that that license I, I take it could be withdrawn. Most definitely. So, uh, if you were to be granted this conditional use, uh, would you accept as a condition the maintenance of a physical therapy license? Oh yes, most definitely. Okay. Uh, my second question is, how committed are you to, to this uh, uh, restraint of traffic? You said on your application, uh, I do not expect to be able to grow the business more than four or five, more than four or five clients a day, th three days a week, totaling 15 to 12 to 15 clients per week maximum. Uh, if you were committed to that, if that were a condition, could uh, could you live with that? Oh, most definitely. So, under no circumstance, then, would you uh, add more than 30 vehicles a week to the traffic in that area? No. And no more than 15. No more than 15. Well, it's coming and going. Oh. Vehicle and traps. And Bruce, I, as I understand, the ordinance allows, uh, restricts conditional uses of this type to no more than a 2% increase in total vehicular traffic? That's correct. Okay. Does the board have other questions, Mr. Pristacci? I'm not uh, so interested in what you're going to do there, but where you're going to do it and, and what the uh, physical um, restrictions of your, of your space is. Could you kind of define where this is going to take place and how you get to it? Yes. Uh, you mentioned parking. Um, I think the ordinance requires additional parking. Uh, I drove by the property this evening and I saw two, park two vehicles in the, in the yard with no opportunity for a third one to park. So would you kind of talk about the parking and the physical uh, structure? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in egress, the height of the basement. I'm, as, I'm assuming it's in the basement, the lighting, ventilation, windows. Uh, go ahead. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure 
the term egress, if you could tell me that so that I... It's very important. It's how you get out of the building in case of a fire. Okay. Or get into the building. Okay. Or firemen. Yeah. Um, with respect to the parking, um, two vehicles can fit in the driveway as well as one in the garage. So that's how third would be accommodated if we were both home at the same time. Um, my husband works full time, so I expect that um, most of the clients would be there during business hours, so his car wouldn't be there anyway. So it would probably just be two cars at any one time. But should there be three cars, one car would then be in the, in the one of our cars would then be in the garage to accommodate another person in the driveway. I'd, I hate to interrupt you, but allow me to interrupt you on this one. Sure. Um, with a vehicle in the garage, right, which leads me to another question, or the, another part of the question, how does one access your parlor, <laughs> your, your office? My office. Clinic. Thank you. Um, my office would then be accessed through the front door. So you'd go through the front door of the house. Uh, you would go through our study dining room, kitchen, and downstairs to the basement, which is where the, currently where the room is located. Um, the room is, what did we say, 14 by 11. I would guess the ceiling is, how many? Seven feet. Um, there is light in there, there are no windows. Um, and there is just that one entrance into and out of the basement. There's no bulkhead? No bulkhead. The room is uh, open on both sides. There's a door on either end of the room because there's more basement around there. Did I answer all of your questions? I'm sorry, was there any? You've answered enough, uh, enough of my concerns. Um, through the chair for the uh, code enforcement officer, she mentioned this one means of egress. Is this adequate? Does this meet the, the uh, city and the town ordinance for uh, a home business? The, def the, the, the fact that it is a home business, I believe, without looking it up, uh, that, that, that uh, as a single family dwelling, believe it or not, code only requires under Boca one entrance exit from any given single family dwelling. Although Life Safety 101 under NFPA does require two exits, we follow, the Cape Elizabeth follows the Boca code. If we follow the state NFPA, then it would have to have two exits. Are you, have you reviewed this, this property and where she wants to, uh, yes. you have, and are you comfortable with the, uh, the facilities? I'm comfortable, comfortable to the fact that, that, that it, it, it's, it, it's, it is a home business, yes. Okay. Are there other questions from the board? Also for the code enforcement officer, if, if at a later time she would like to put up a sign is there, um, are there any regulations as to what size the sign and appearance and that type of? Yes, you can have a small sign. I think uh, home business is six square feet, I believe. Okay. So it's fairly small. So that's something that she's, that, that she can avail herself. She could a time. have a sign, correct. I'd be happy to make a condition that I would never put yeah, up no. a sign. You indicated also that you don't plan on advertising. How will your, do you, are you operating from the existing customer base? Um, probably be some existing customer base as well as, as I mentioned, just um, acquaintances that we know from running or biking or cross-country skiing, as well as physicians that I work with that would refer somebody perhaps to a home business either because they don't have insurance and mm -hmm. situations like that. Any other questions of the applicant from the board? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, 
We'll now hear from any proponents, those in favor of this application. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Can I make a comment before we hear from proponents and opponents? And if it's appropriate, most appropriate to make it now as opposed to once we close the hearing, yes. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that, I'm sure the applicant knows this, but I'm not sure the other people who are interested in this know this, and that is that the zoning board makes its decision on a conditional use based on seven criteria. And uh, if you're going to make a comment, at least I would appreciate if your comment be directed at at least one of these seven criteria rather than um, something that's really not directed to the criteria that we have to apply for our decision. Uh, the seven criteria, I'll read them briefly here. Uh, not more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be involved or employed in the business. The nature of the business of professional use shall not increase vehicular traffic by more than 2% of the current average annual daily traffic. The business of professional use shall not produce any odors, fumes, dust, glare, noise, or electrical interference in excess of that produced by normal residential use. Any external alteration shall not detract from the residential character of the neighborhood. The square footage shall occupy an area no greater than 20% of the floor area of the structure. All signs shall comply with the sign ordinance, and there shall be no outdoor storage of equipment and materials. Those are the criteria that we as a zoning board have to consider and uh, apply in considering this application. So if you're making a comment, I would appreciate if you relate your comment to at least one of these seven criteria that we use. If I may add, there are conditions, standards, uh, that also have to be met that right. they people should have the right to comment on. You're on page 50. Mm -hmm. A through F on the application. Okay. We are um, still for the moment at the point of entertaining those who would like to speak in favor of this application. Uh, there being none, um, anybody wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Is there anyone that would wish to speak? There being none, we will close the public hearing and have discussion on the board. Personally, I think this fits the definition of a home business just perfectly. Um, I, think, I think this fits the definition of a home business that's in our, our regulations here just perfectly. Um, to uh, assure the neighbors that this doesn't get out of hand, I might suggest that we consider applying this 15 clients per week maximum as a condition of approval if we do approve this. But other than that, I, I don't see any problems with it. I like, the, I like Bob's suggestion um, of a condition that there be, as a condition that um, the applicant maintain a current physical therapy license um, issued by the state of Maine. Um, I also think that we should consider restrictions on hours of use um, and take the applicant up on her offer of a condition that there be no uh, signage um, on the premises visible uh, to the outside. I'd like to second that because one of the standards for, for a conditional use approval is that the proposed use will not adversely affect the property of adjacent, the value of adjacent properties. Uh, if there's signage, I I'm sympathetic to the view of one of the uh, opposition persons who uh, said it might devalue their property. So if we might put it as a condition, uh, the absence of signage, that's, that no signage be allowed, that uh, that should deal with that with that issue. Okay. Which there, leaves us with, I'm sorry. There, I, I have a question. It was the um, question about hours of use and restricting those. Um, did you have a suggestion? Who was it that proposed it? Is that you? Um, I think the applicant herself said that she um, wouldn't anticipate um, certainly any clients before 730, and I think that anything before 730 would be too early and appropriate anyway. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm comfortable with 730 on the early side, um, and um, probably no later than 730 on the uh, late side, maybe 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. 
somewhat arbitrary, but mm -hmm. there's some logic to it. Okay. Are there any other conditions that people would like to suggest? I still have a concern about parking. Um, I live in the neighborhood. Uh, initially, I, I didn't think I had a concern with it, but again, uh, there's no off-street parking uh, except for that one parking space. If you operate uh, after the hours of 5 o'clock, uh, it possibly is going to be occupied. Uh, the street is narrower than what I expected, uh, than I thought, and certainly in the evening, a lot of people do take the opportunity to park their vehicle in the street. Um, I, th I think you'd want to take a long look at the, the parking situation there. Um, my other concern was was the uh, the physical physical operation, the physical place, and Bruce has assured me that uh, it meets the town ordinances, so I don't have a problem with that. But I still have reservations about parking. Would there be a um, a condition of use that would that would address that concern? Uh, for example, um, that cars um, must park off street. No, I don't want to make that stipulation. I think that, uh, you know, if you operate between the hours of 9 and 4, um, off-street parking isn't a problem. Uh, before 9, the school buses, uh, people are, are um, uh, board, their, board their children uh, until, what, 8.30 or so. And then certainly after 4 o'clock, uh, the people come home and they do park in the street, and the street gets narrower. So um, I, I don't think I want to, you know, put any any stipulations on it. I, I just, uh, you know, I'll go with what the board wants to do. Would it be an unrealistic burden to uh, condition the approval on uh, there being no more than one client vehicle at the property at a time? Would that address your concern? I don't think she's going to be operating uh, multi-clients, at least that's the way she's presented it to us. So one vehicle is going to be standard. No, it would just be I'm just worried about where the cars are scheduled back to yeah. back and therefore there are two cars there <coughs> for a short period of time. No, I, again, I, I'd like to hear the other, other views. I'm not, I'm not that concerned. I mean, it's, it's an issue. Um, and I seem to be the only one that, ha that has that concern, so I'm going to wait, wait and see what, what other people's feelings are. Okay. I, th I think 7.30 is, is, is quite early, and 7.30 in the evening is, is quite late. Um, and I think that was one of the concerns that most of the neighbors that signed the petition had. Uh, I mean, they, their concerns also were, was that. I think part of the a home business, the way I see it, would be for the flexibility, and I can appreciate her request to have the flexible hours, and I think that she has offered a solution for the parking. There are three spots, and there may be three cars, but three cars can be um, appropriately dealt with. I agree that there's not a lot of room for leeway, there's not a lot of room for a fourth car, but right now she is meeting the needs, and I don't think that the, the problem that we potentially could be addressing creates rises to the level where it would prohibit us under the, the, sta, um, the zoning ordinance here that it creates a hazardous traffic condition that would require this, us to deny this application. So I, I can appreciate what you're saying, but I think that she's met. Okay, two points. One, yes, it is for the convenience of, of the uh, the operator, but it's also not for the the uh, inconvenience of the of the neighbors. I mentioned that uh, in the evening there's parking on street. If there's parking in this driveway, uh, a client backing out is going to have a quite a hard time seeing the cars up and down the street because of the vehicles. And the cars do go, go by, uh, by there very, very fast. Uh, and I, I know you're disagreeing with me, but I've lived there for nine years, and I've seen, I've seen what's happening there, and it's getting worse. And it's that hour of the day. It's not be between the hours of 9 and 4. I've got absolutely no problem. In fact, I was hoping that that's what you would have limit the operation to because on-street parking, I'm in favor of. In fact, I'd prefer to have people parking on the street. Uh, but if they're there, there's, there's a physical problem with them, and they may have uh, limiting factors which prevent them from looking up and down the street. Again, it's my opinion. I've stated it. I'm going to sit back and listen.
Any other concerns or thoughts? Yeah, just, just on the procedure, procedural question that we vote on conditions to attach uh, to an approval, up or down, individually, uh, and then vote on the conditions of conditional use permit as a whole, subject to those conditions. We could certainly do that, and that would That seems, help in us my experience, that. that's the way it works out the best. Okay. Is everyone yeah. comfortable with that? So I, I would propose at the first condition that the uh, applicant maintain a, a state license as a uh, licensed physical therapist. Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. Is there any dis further discussion on it? Um, I'd simply like to propose that it be amended to uh, be a license issued by the state of Maine. Yeah, but that's, what that's what I meant. Okay. I'll, I'll accept it as a friendly amendment. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Mm -hmm. It's unanimous. Is there another condition that someone would like to propose? That the, I, I propose that the uh, clientele be limited to 15 clients a week. Is there a second to that? Second. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay, all in favor? All opposed? Mm. Unanimous. Is there another condition? I'd like to make a motion that the hours of operations be limited to nine to four weekdays. That's Monday through Friday. I'll second the motion. Okay, there's been a motion and a, and a second. Is there discussion? Are we, do we have an opportunity to ask the applicant? whether that is compatible with her plans? We could make that opportunity. Um, would you like to come to the um, podium? Um, obviously, it's not as ideal, um, but I, if that's the way that the board chooses to vote, I'd be happy to accommodate that. Um, it doesn't offer me as much flexibility. Um, uh, when I think it was Mr. Backer suggested the 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., I would assume then the last client would be at 6 o'clock to allow that person to be done and out by 7.30. Um, but I also appreciate uh, what Mr. Fustacci, I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, um, <laughs> said regarding, um, you know, bus traffic and things like that. Those are the busier times on that street, and that street does have quite a bit of traffic. Um, I still don't believe that my business would impact that. Um, but again, if the board chooses to impose those hours, I would comply with them. Okay, thank you. Is there further board discussion about well, that? I'd like, like to make a comment. I think based on the conditional use permit application that I was familiar with earlier, we actually ended up finding out what the state standard, I guess, an estimate of number of car trips per house was. And it was like 10 per day. And so we, we talk about 36 houses here, that's 360 car trips per day, so <coughs> per week. And her, her volume here is so low compared to, it's way under 2%. Um, I, I guess I'm not in favor of restricting it to, to a 4 p.m. thing, because I think there are people who would be, want this kind of um, treatment after work, after normal work hours. And I'd be much more supportive of uh, Mr. Backer's 7.30, 7.30 suggestion. I think that you'll find that this is a, uh, a different classified, uh, the, the, the street has a different classification. It's either a collector or a connector which has been established with, by, the, uh, by the town as having considerably more traffic than those people living on it. Um, I'm simply saying that I think the impact of the maximum... Well, oh, the impact is minimal. Is minimal. Min minimal. And, um, for a lot of clients, it's 6 o'clock at night, um, leaving maybe as late as 7.30. I, I just can't see it. operating three days a week. Um, I just can't see it being any noticeable increase in traffic. And, and part of the reason for my suggestion of 7.30 to 7.30 was the, the idea of someone being able to go in before work or 
stop by on the <coughs> trying to be sensitive to the concerns of the neighborhood. And we certainly don't want people coming in there at 6.30 in the morning or at 9 o'clock at night, um, or leaving at 9 o'clock at night, um, but also wanting, if we're going to permit a home business, to permit it in a way that makes it a viable okay. home business. Um, I said when I said 7.30 to 7.30 that it was somewhat arbitrary, and it is, but the rationale was to permit at least one time slot before work and one time slot after normal working hours. Um, I mean, I'd certainly be game to, to narrow that. Um, and I'd certainly be amenable to the Monday through Friday restriction. I recommend we call the question. And then if there's any other proposals, if it's voted up or down, then people can add other conditions. People agreeable to taking a vote on this at this time? Mm -hmm. All in favor, voting immediately. We're Wait, voting on motion. 9 to 10. In favor, the motion is the, to nine to the hours of operation 9 to 4. Okay. Um, let's do that then. All in favor of 9 to 4. I see two votes. All opposed? One, two, three, four, five votes. Okay. Is there another? proposal regarding the hours that someone would like to put forth? I would move that there be a restriction of hours from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Would that be Monday through Friday, Jay? I'm not sure that if it's fine with the applicant, then I have no objection to it. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking 7.30 to 7, 7.30, 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., Monday through Monday Friday. Through Friday right. Is there a second on that? A second. Okay, is there any further discussion? There being none, all in favor of that? All opposed? So one mm. opposed and six in favor? Okay. Mm. And I propose a conditional use that no signage be attached to the business whatsoever. Is there a second to that? Second. Is there any discussion? All, fi all in favor? All opposed? Seven to zero. Are there any other conditions that anyone would like to propose? Okay. Um, it was a good process, and we'll now, um, I'd now entertain a, a motion regarding the application as a whole with these conditions. I move that the uh, application of uh, Sarah Hathaway Merrill with the conducting of, oh, we have it all for here? Yeah, it's in your packet. Maybe we could share it. Uh, I propose that the application for a conditional use to operate a home business by the applicant, uh, Sarah Hathaway Merrill, uh, be approved on grounds that the board had finds that the proposed use will not create uh, hazardous conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity, that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal emissions to the air or other as aspects of its design of, uh, and or operation. The proposed use will not adversely affect the property value, affect the value of adjacent properties, that the proposed use, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with the adjacent property uses with the comprehensive plan, and that the design and external appearance of any proposed buildings will constitute uh, uh, that that provision is moved, uh, subject to the conditions approved by the board to it that uh, the hours of use will be uh, limited to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We threw out the uh, no, money to. Monday, Monday. Uh, on a Monday through Friday basis. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. Okay. That the uh, owner of the business maintain a, a main state license in, phys in physical therapy, that uh, no sign of any sort be uh, erected advertising the, bu the business. Uh, what else do we have? 15. And that the clientele be limited to 15 clients per week. Isn't there one more? I have a... There were four. I, I'm sorry, you turned yeah. up. Um, yeah, th those were the four. Okay. And there needs to be, that's a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, is there discussion? Before we vote, 
and uh, I thought I saw our council here. The request for conditional use states 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I'm, I'm assuming that this was what all the neighbors were made aware and were uh, advised of. Can we change that, uh, that time frame and be more, uh, more liberal in the operation, the hours of operations by going to 7.30 uh, a.m. to 7.30 p.m. since it's been advertised this way? Well, the people who are notified are the same people that have, have an opportunity to come to the meeting to discuss. So I would assume that you could, you could change it. You couldn't change it if the ordinance specifically stated hours. But I believe you can consult with Mike Hill. But. Um, Mr. Hill, please identify yourself. Sure. Uh, Michael Hill from Monaghan Leahy, town attorney. Uh, the board does have the authority to impose reasonable restrictions. And if the board uh, felt that uh, the 7.30 p.m. Uh, was an appropriate restriction that you'd have the authority to make that even though the request was originally for uh, 8 to eight to 7. I think it's within your authority. No, we're not going to get in trouble. Hopefully not, Mr. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I just, again, I point out to the, to the other board members that she did ask for 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. that has an influence on the voting. Actually, I think Joe's point is a good one. And I actually hadn't um, hadn't recalled that that was in the petition uh, in the application um, and my inclination would be not to grant terms more liberal than what the applicant had requested so uh, in point of order though we this has been voted upon and approved you we can, can reconsider, reconsider that if, if, the, if the board members feel more comfortable keeping it at the seven o'clock it was originally requested you could go back and change that condition and Um, I'd like to move that the board reconsider the 7.30 to 7.30 uh, time restriction. Um, and I would move that the 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. time restriction, Monday through Friday, be amended uh, to 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday, consistent with the applicant's uh, original request to the board in writing. Is there a second to that? I second that. Okay, is there any further discussion on that? All in favor of that motion? You're voting on the reconsideration? Voting on the reconsideration. Okay, I'm in favor of that. Actually, technically, we, have, we need to vote first to reconsider. All in favor <laughs> of reconsidering? Sir, all opposed? Okay, we're now reconsidering. Um, and the motion, um, would you like to just st restate your motion? Um, the motion was the to reconsider and amend the hours of operation from 7.30 a.m to 7.30 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. Okay. Uh, is there a second to that? Second. All right. Is there any discussion on that? All in favor of that motion? Uh, seven to z seven, all opposed, zero. Okay. Um, we now have back the main motion. Uh, is there... Uh, that motion, is there any further discussion on this motion for this application and the conditions that we have agreed upon? There being none, all in favor? Seven to seven, all opposed, none, so seven to zero. Okay, um, that, concludes, that concludes this business. Thank you very much.
Okay. We now turn to the second item of new business, which is to hear the administrative appeal of Amp Anthony Armstrong and Julie Armstrong at 32 Lawson Road and Kimberly Moody of 1 Roberts Lane and Rita Yarnold of 24 Larson Lawson Road of Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith's decision granting building permit number 000437 on May 12, 2000, as amended on May 30, 2000, to Daniel and Diane Caputo at 31 Lawson Road tax map. U08, Lot 34. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, because I've discussed this uh, the board prior to uh, the instigation of, of these uh, of balance uh, appeals to, uh, with one of the applicants, I'm going to recuse myself in this matter. Okay. Thank you. All right. And as we um, as we do, um, I'd first like to ask uh, the Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith to um, give us a very brief overview of uh, the actions that have been taken on this case. Mr. Smith. Um, on May 10, 2000, I issued bill implement number 000437 and amended that same bill implement on May 30, 2000 to construct a 10 by 13 addition to the garage at 31 Lawson Road, tax map U08, lot 34 for Diane and uh, Daniel and Diane Caputo. Um, they are the record owners. The property is in a residential A district and is overlaid by Shoreland Performance Overlay District. The portion of the structure is located at a distance less than the required 75 feet from the normal high water line and is therefore non conforming. Um, I, the, the normal high water line has previously been determined on December 10, 1990 as depicted on a plan titled Plan Showing Location of Normal High Water Line made by made for Dan Caputo, dated December 11, 1999. And as a consequence of that issuance, uh, the Zoning Board has determined an administrative appeal on February 1st that I correctly determined the location of the Normal High Water Line as defined by the Zoning Ordinance. Uh, there's been an administrative appeal by several of the neighbors neighbors um, of my issuance of that permit and uh, therefore that's why we're here. Okay. Thank you. And who would like to speak for this application? Do we have an opportunity to ask the code enforcement officer questions at this time? If you have a question now, you could do that. That would be in order. Is this okay. a, a factual Nature? Well, I'd like to know what the uh, purpose of the building permit was for. It was to add on a 10 by 13 workshop to the existing attached garage. Uh, that garage is attached? To the house, correct. Okay. 10 by 13 what, Prince? Workshop. Workshop. Okay. Um, who would like to speak for this application, for this appeal? Excuse me. Yes, please come, identify yourself. My name is Julie Armstrong, and I'm here on behalf of myself, my husband, Anthony Armstrong, as well as Kimberly Moody and Rita Yarnold. Um, they may have very brief statements uh, at some point that they'd like to make, but I am speaking on their behalf. And for starters, uh, since the Lewis versus Rockport case, which I um, provided to the board last week, um, held that the burden of proof in terms of proving that a project complies with the shoreland zoning provisions is upon the applicants and not upon the parties seeking uh, to overturn the building permit. I feel that it would be appropriate for the Caputos to go first, since they are the ones with the burden of proof, and we will, in effect, be responding to their case. Actually, our board procedures uh, state very clearly that the person um, submitting the appeal um, presents first. And I'd like to ask um, Mike Hill, town council, to respond to that procedurally. Am I correct? Yeah, that, that is uh, the uh, procedure that we have if the appellant, uh, that the appellant would go first. It does not change uh, who has the burden of proof, and, and uh, Ms. Armstrong is correct that that burden of showing 
that the uh, issuance of the building permit was in compliance with the town's ordinance is on uh, the uh, Caputo's, but I don't think that who goes first really shifts that burden of proof. Burden of proof, the board should understand, is uh, on the Caputo's to make sure that the elements of the building permit are all met, that the ordinance is met. So, and I don't think that having the Armstrongs uh, or the appellant go first changes that burden of proof. It still okay. remains with the Caputo's. I'd like to make a motion, um, and that is that the board go into executive session uh, with our legal counsel to review the rights uh, and duties of the board. Um, that motion is in order. Is there a second? Second. Um, all in, is there a discussion on that? All in favor of going into executive session on the rights and duties of the board? Uh, six to zero. Uh, then we will go into executive session um, and into the other room, and we'll be back when we're finished. Um, this will be with the board members and with the uh, town council. Uh, my understanding is that um, I don't believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe that Mr. Smith is part of this meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the executive session uh, is only between the board members and the town attorney. Okay, thank you. Before we get started, I have um, two two announcements. One is it is that it, it is a hot evening, and uh, a public health message is to be sure that you drink a lot of fluids in this unair conditioned building, which is certainly economical for the town, but uncomfortable on a few days in the summer in Maine. So um, bear with the uh, the temperature. Um, the second is that our, the board rules um, stipulate that no new cases um, before the board be started after 10 p.m. on any night of session. Um, given the, the, um, the bulk of the materials and the, the evidence of this case that we have um, just begun, it is highly probable that we will not have time to hear the third case of uh, Donald Head and Karen, Karen Zand prior to 10 o'clock. And therefore, I wanted to let, uh, I don't know who you are, so, uh, we will, um, I wanted to give you warning of that, um, and we could reschedule it for the next month's board meeting. Um, you could wait to see if we are able to um, hear this case and, and be ready to hear yours before 10 p.m., but I think it unlikely. So I wanted to give you that option now in the evening. You can come to the podium and address that. Are, are you, um, identify yourself and go from there. Uh, I'm John Ted of 1237 Sawyer Road. Uh, I would respect, respectfully suggest that uh, a month's delay in this hearing uh, would create quite a hardship for us in, our, uh, in the project we're uh, seeking your approval of tonight. Uh, so we would uh, certainly prefer uh, to push on and uh, get through if we can, or is there a provision for uh, 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 no. continuing the meeting at a sooner time? Uh, there is an option, if possible, to schedule a special meeting of the board that would depend on um, being able to um, schedule this room and to schedule a quorum of the board members. Um, Madam Chair. May I request such a Excuse me. I'm, I'm willing to stay as long as it takes to hear what we have before on the agenda this evening. I know one has to, to travel quite a ways, actually two, but I'm willing to stay. If there's others um, to accommodate the applicant, you know, I'd, I'd be willing. We need four to make a decision. Correct. We need, we need a quorum of four. Is that correct, Mr. Hill? Do we have four that would be able to stay? I think we'd have to see how late it was at that point. I, I will be excusing myself from hearing uh, the matter because of a, I'm not sure it's a real conflict of interest, but a potential, at okay. least perceived conflict. Uh, Mr. Head's business uh, manages the uh, retirement funds for my law office, Robinson Krieger McCallum. 
and I personally have done legal work for Mr. Head. Okay, so you would be recused. So I would be excusing myself from hearing his case. Okay. Are there any other board members that continuing, <clears throat> continuing on for some time tonight, still at the board's discretion, might be a, a problem? You I can stay. stay. I'll stay as um, well. Mr. Keneally cannot stay. Um, I can. That would be four. And is Mr. Cronin still in the room? He'll be back. Okay, so we would have a quorum. Well, then um, I'm glad that we um, at least have uh, done a determination at this time that let's let's see how late it gets, um, but um, invite you to stay and hopefully we'll get to hear your case. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we will um, return to where we were um, hearing the, uh, I, I believe uh, Julie Armstrong had just uh, stood up <laughs> and I'd like to invite you back up uh, to the podium to make a presentation. Thank you. And for starters, I would like to thank the chair for um, informing the parties and the public about the documents that the board has received in preparation for the hearing as part of the record. I really appreciate that change. Um, for starters, in terms of facilitating and speeding up the process, I would like to uh, recommend or ask the board to accept the, my written outline as uh, written testimony and written argument so that I don't have to go through everything in the outline. I do want to um, do some highlighting and talk about some of the issues that we haven't gotten into before, maybe go over a few of them a little bit that we have gotten into before. Um, it seems that's a way of uh, facilitating that process. So is would the board accept my outline as written testimony and argument for the hey, record? I, I will clarify for the record that um, this was mailed to board members um, and um, at least received by myself on Friday and I presume most other board members the packet that you sent and that, that was appreciated but I would ask if there's any objection from board members here to accepting that as she has requested. Is there any, is there any uh, concern about that? I guess my question goes not so much to accepting it, but accepting it for what? And I'm offering it. Um, there are factual statements in it that I would like accepted as written testimony from me. Um, and then there are also arguments that also. Certainly, we can accept it as written testimony. Thank you. That'll no objections to accepting it as written testimony. Have the Caputos received the same? Yes, they received one uh, probably a day earlier since it was hand delivered to their attorney. Uh, I do want to go over a couple of legal standards again. Uh, for starters, in Lewis versus the town of Rockport, the court held that the burden of proving that a project complies with the provisions of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance is upon the party seeking the, excuse me, and uh, as the town's council, uh, Mr. Hill stated, uh, there doesn't seem to be any dispute about that. Secondly, um, it is well established that since the spirit of zoning ordinances is to restrict rather than to increase nonconformities, provisions of a zoning regulation for the continuation of nonconformities must be strictly construed. And similarly, provisions limiting nonconforming uses must be liberally construed. This means that provisions allowing for any expansion must be strictly construed uh, meaning read narrowly and restrictively, and the language prohibiting any expansion that would increase the nonconformity of the structure must be liberally construed, meaning that prohibition should be read expansively, meaning prohibiting more things than if it were read strictly. Grievance number one in our application deals with the issue that this board rejected in the prior case heard on February 1st and is now before the Superior Court. That is the issue of whether, notwithstanding Section 1944B1A, whether Section 1944B1 prohibits any expansion within 75 feet of the normal high water line, since such expansion would increase the nonconformity of the structure, according to the court in Lewis. And we would respectfully ask you to reconsider that issue, which also applies to this case, and I won't spend any more time on that. 
Grievance number two is a new issue that you didn't have in the prior case. It's a new issue for the board, I believe, and it is an extremely significant issue for the town of Cape Elizabeth. The issue is whether increasing the building footprint within 75 feet of the water increases the non-conformity of the structure, thereby violating section 1944B1. Since the garage expansion would increase the footprint of the structure, we would suggest that this question must be answered in the affirmative. There can be no question that expanding the building footprint <coughs> of a structure increases the non-conformity of that structure and is violated by B1. This was acknowledged by the Caputo's attorney at the February 1st hearing. In Exhibit 19, I have submitted an excerpt from his statement and on page 49 from the transcript, uh, he stated in relevant part, we have an ordinance and a statute here that says you can expand for less than 30% as long as you don't increase the nonconformity. How do we make that a reality? How do we say, how do we have our expansion and not increase nonconformity at the same time? I submit to you that the answer is, comes from looking at the Rockport case. You can't increase the footprint, but you can increase the volume. That way, you expand the building that is a non-conforming structure, but you don't expand the non-conformity. <laughs> and that's exactly what this ordinance contemplates, and by interpreting the ordinance that way, you give effect to both, both pieces of the ordinance. And that is a quote from Caputo's attorney in the prior hearing. Now, they are telling you that the ordinance, or I presumably will tell you that the ordinance means something different. Now, if increasing the building footprint within 75 feet of the water does not increase the nonconformity of a structure, what would? When you expand a, build, a building footprint, you increase the amount of ground that is covered, you increase the amount of shoreland that is covered by a building. So even if you don't accept what you haven't, that going up on a building increases the nonconformity. We feel that it's obvious that increasing the footprint does increase the nonconformity. <coughs> and remember, the board, by law, must liberally construe this provision that limits nonconformity. And it must strictly construe any provision that allows for building. So in other words, and that, that's probably kind of complicated to look at it both ways. The language on limiting non-conformities, that it shall not be more non-conforming, has to be liberally construed. In other words, you have to give that as much effect as you can, given that language. But the provision that you have to, you can only build 30%, has to be strictly construed. You have to give that the narrowest meaning that you can, given the language. The court has said that. We believe accordingly that, that uh, the, this issue would be dispositive in this case uh, because there's no question that this building permit application would increase the footprint within the 75 feet. Grievance number three deals with an issue that this board rejected in the prior case and is now before the Superior Court also. And that issue is whether the expansion that was the subject of the February 1st hearing increased the volume by 30% or more. If so, the portion of the structure within the 75-foot setback cannot be expanded at all. So we would again respectfully ask you to reconsider that issue, which also applies to this case, since if the 30% figure has already been exceeded, then no more building can be allowed during the lifetime of the structure. Grievance number four, the Caputos have not demonstrated that the proposed addition would not result in an increase in volume of 30% or more over the life of the structure, 
even when using the normal high water line established by Code Enforcement Officer Smith. As I stated before, the court in Lewis held that the burden is on the applicant seeking to expand a structure in the shoreland zone to prove that the expansion does not violate the provisions of the shoreland zoning. We believe that the documents that have been offered in support of the building permit do not show or do not prove that uh, the 30% provision has not been exceeded even if you accept the high water line uh, accepted by Mr. Uh, excuse me, established by Mr. Smith, um, particularly if you do not consider the volume in the basement, and that was an issue that this board never got to. I will hold the discussion about that for uh, rebuttal or response to the Caputo. Since the burden on that issue was theirs, it's a little hard to to respond in advance, and the uh, Caputos may, for all we know, be able to conclusively establish that they wouldn't exceed the 30 percent, and it wouldn't be necessary to delve too far into that issue. And finally, reason <laughs> number five, that CEO Smith has not required the applicants to demonstrate that their proposal is in conformity with the shoreland zoning provisions of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance and State Law. Uh, we believe that, that the code enforcement officer has not required them to provide specific calculations that would enable us to ascertain whether they've exceeded the 30% provision. It's very tough to tell what those numbers are from looking at them, at least it is for me. Uh, it also appears to be in violation of the 30-foot street setback that applies in the shoreland zone. Um, and again, this burden is on the Caputos to prove that it is in conformity with that requirement. So in conclusion, and again, I will be, I'm sure, responding to um, the Caputos presentation, we ask you to very carefully consider this important issue for the town of Cape Elizabeth. The shoreline is Cape Elizabeth's most important natural resource and this board has an obligation to liberally construe the prohibition against increasing the nonconformity and to strictly construe the provisions allowing building uh, in adding to a nonconforming structure and so we would ask you to uh, grant our appeal and to deny the building permit thank you I'd be happy to answer any questions if the board members have. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from the board members at this time of Julie Armstrong? Um, yeah. I'd just like to say that I really appreciate the packet that you put together for us. It's very well done. It's very comprehensive. And it was great to get ahead of time and have an opportunity to review it. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. Appreciate those comments. Uh, I, I think that uh, Rita Yarnold um, would like to say something, and Kim Moody may perhaps like to make a few comments. Would this be an appropriate time for well, Let's that see if happen? the board members have any other questions for you first, and then we'll invite them to make comments. Just what zoning is this? You mentioned zoning. <laughs> what, what zone is this building in? It is in RA with a, in the Shoreland Overlay District. And the 30, per, the 30 foot provision <clears throat> that I referred to is for the, the shoreland zone, outside of the shoreland zone, the street um, frontage provision is 25 feet. Outside it's 25, inside it's 30. Okay. Are there other questions for the appellant at this time? Okay, thank, thank you. We might have questions for you later. Is there someone else that would like to speak? Kimberly Moody. I live at uh, 22 Lawson Road. And I will also wait um, to hear from the Caputos, um, but visually, and again, I appreciate the packet, but I'm not an attorney and I had a hard time getting through all the details. 
Um, but the footprint is definitely um, being expanded. The ground is broken for this expansion of the garage. Um, visually, it looks like 50% volume. I mean, just from a visual point of view, so I'm anxious to see the calculations. But um, it is very upsetting as a neighbor to see this kind of um, expansion going on. Thank you. <coughs> is there anyone else in favor of this appeal that would like to speak at this time? All right, then um, we'll invite the Caputo uh, representatives to come to the podium. brief. Uh, I'm John McVeigh. I represent the Caputos. We've been here before. Um, we've worked closely with the code enforcement officer and submitted materials to the code enforcement officer, which have been in your packet and are in the building permit application. Our architect, Mr. Lloyd, is here and he'll I'll bring him up to give you some updated calculations because the design of the uh, garage had to change when a greenhouse was removed for it from the initial calculations that were given to Mr. Smith, and we have some new calculations we can give tonight. We're still well within the 30%, uh, even including the expansion that uh, was done on the house. It's a very small, uh, a very small portion of this uh, uh, workshop expansion, just in total, 10 by 13, is over that, uh, that setback line from the high water mark. I want to say a couple of things about reconsideration. <clears throat> There's a case which I supplied with Mr. Hill called Crosby uh, versus the uh, town of uh, Belgrade, I believe. And uh, it stands, in my opinion, for the proposition that when you have the same issue, same property, same parties, and you've already decided that issue in the previous proceeding, you don't get to revisit it in a subsequent proceeding. And uh, the issue of where the high water line is has been decided. Uh, and has yet to be overturned by any superior court and is a final decision, and that is an issue that need not be revisited tonight. Uh, there's nothing new being presented to this board. Pa the materials you have in your new packet are the same materials that were in the old packet, uh, and that, that has been decided. Um, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith has done a, uh, the job of locating where that high water line is uh, under the ordinance, and the measurements are where they are. So I don't think it's proper to revisit that issue at that time when this board already having made what still counts as a final decision on that matter. Um, there is an issue uh, about the town of Rockport and the case and, and how that applies to the Cape Elizabeth ordinance. Uh, sometimes lawyers get in a position where someone says, as Ms. Uh, Armstrong has said, well, you, last week you said something different. We argue things based on the facts of the case that are in front of us. When we were, I was here previously, and the, the case of the town of Rockport was being argued as a reason why the residence should not be expanded. I pointed out that the town of Rockport case said you can't expand the footprint of the building, and that case didn't apply to the expansion of the residence because we weren't changing the footprint of the building. That was the point of that presentation. Here, we are changing the footprint of the building. No question about that. The question is, under those facts, does the town of Rockport case apply to the ordinance that Cape Elizabeth has permitting a 30% expansion of a non-conforming structure? The town of Rockport did not have an ordinance that allowed 30% expansion of a non-conforming structure. That's the difference between the ordinances that were under review in the town of Rockport and this ordinance. And in fact, the state statute that the, our ordinances, that the Cable Zip ordinance is uh, modeled after, also allows a 30% expansion. 
and I understood from the code enforcement officer that the state's own illustrations of what kinds of expansions could be allowed under such a statute would involve an increase into the setback as long as it wasn't in excess of 30%. This is the handbook from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, Maine Shoreland Zoning Handbook for Shoreland Owners. And on page 11 of that, they talk about what kinds of expansion might be allowed under such an ordinance and such a statute. And it does appear to allow the interpretation of the ordinance that Mr. Smith has engaged in and the way the Cape Elizabeth ordinance has apparently been interpreted by the town up to now. This was in your prior packet as one of the things that you looked at to make a determination that that allowance could happen. I didn't include it in this packet, but I'm glad to pass this down and enter it as evidence. I'm not going to argue that we have a law court decision that tells us what this statute means. But I am going to argue that the town of Rockport case interpreted a statute that is not like Cape Elizabeth's statute. And we go back to where we were before. If you have a statute that allows a 30% expansion, you have to define how that expansion can occur because the statute says you can expand. And the question is, therefore, what is permissible? I submit to you that under the facts we are presented with now and under the way that the town has interpreted its own ordinance historically, that you can expand into that setback as long as you're not, the entire structure isn't expanded by more than 30%. So that's the legal issue. I am sure that whichever way you go, we'll be arguing about this in some other place, but that's our position and we believe you can approve this expansion as a matter of law and disregard the holding in the town of Rockport case because the ordinance there is completely different. And now I'm just going to call the architect to provide some of the volume calculations and that will be the end of my presentation. Yes, I'm sorry. Did you have some questions? There may be some questions of you before anyone else comes up with the board. Does anyone have a question? All right, we might have questions for you later. Sure. Thank you. My name is David Loy. I'm a licensed architect. This is the smallest addition I've ever presented to anybody. But this is a 10-6 by 13-6 workroom off the side of the garage. Could you restate those dimensions? I'm sorry. Well, it's all been submitted, but it's 10-foot-6 by 13-foot-6 workroom addition off the side of the garage. I just went back and revisited all the calculations on the house. As this young woman mentioned, she saw a hole in the ground and didn't understand the volume. Well, I mean, all the volumes, I mean, you can't look at this house. You have to take the entire volume within the 75-foot mark of the house, of the garage, I mean, all of those things. So it gets complicated. You can't just look at it. But the actual piece that's going into the 75-foot area is 10-6 by 4. So it's approximately, you know, rounded off 40 square feet of increased footprint. The house right now, with a 30 percent increase on all the area within the 75-foot mark, would yield 375 square feet. On the main house, we're asking for an increase of 130 square feet. And that's no increase of footprint because the expansion on the house is all within eaves. We just raised the roof and gave some more square footage within the house. But the footprint didn't change. On the garage, it will change by 40 feet. But if you add 40 feet to 130, you're still not near the 375 square feet. The house itself, again, we're right now in the house. We're at 21 percent expansion overall on the house. So this little addition here will bring it up closer to 30 percent, but still under it. I don't have those exact figures because on this one line here, we were discussing with Bruce on the high-water mark location. But I feel confident in saying that 
we're, we're within the 30 percent. I'd be glad to submit an exact figure on that. Uh, but, and uh, this is something that, you know, I've been practicing in Maine for 20 years. I've, I've done uh, jobs all over the state, and this is a fairly typical interpretation of, of a setback from the water line and, and where you're expanding the building. You don't increase the nonconformity because you don't go up beyond where the existing house line is, and we're not doing that. We're actually still stepped back in. Uh, but as uh, John mentioned, that's still an uh, interpretation for the court to do, but we've been interpreting it for years this way. Thank you. Uh, this is the same one that you submitted? Uh, I did it I did that today. Okay. Thank you. Before you sit down, may I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You mentioned the addition is 10-6 by 13-6. By right. Is that addition within the 75-foot setback area? There's four feet of that within the 75-foot mark. What portion of the garage is in the 75-foot setback? Um, there's a portion of the garage. I, uh, and that's been submitted. That line goes through the garage. Uh, and that's, that's on the original documents. Off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know exactly because the line moves through the garage. Um, but let's see. I mean, it would be approximately running through the garage. It would come back uh, 13, approximately 12 to 13 feet. Uh, the front of the garage is forward of the 75-foot mark. What are the total overall dimensions of the garage? Um, just the garage? This is just rough. It's 20 by 30. I think it's very important that we have something better than rough yeah. because we're talking square footage of this. Um, what is the setback? The setback issue was brought up tonight. What is the setback of this addition from the road? The, uh, the setback off the road is, uh, well. 27 feet. Okay, 27 feet. Well, I heard earlier that the setback should be 30 feet. Now, um, I've got, <laughs> this is a very sensitive issue. Uh, you're not specific with dimensions you guessed on the setback. Based on your uncertainty and the sensitivity of this issue, I think it's extremely important that we get specific dimensions and spe specific setbacks, specific calculations. Now, it bothers me that there's been activity there, and yet it might be in violation. Oh. Uh, Wait a minute now, I have the floor. I have the floor. Unless you can prove to me that, that you're within the setback tonight, then I'm gonna make motion that we table this to resolve these issues. Now, Is there any the, setback issue, the setback has been brought up and you're telling me it's 27, it should be 30. No, somebody could. Let's, wait a minute. Well, then, Every, I, then I'll, yield, then I'll yield, yield to the chair to, to clarify those. We'll need some clarification for that would be our dimensions attorney. of the structure as well as um, as well as um, length of um, setback that's been measured. And if you don't have it, does Mr. McVeigh or Mr. Caputo have it? Certainly, you may come to the microphone and introduce yourself. I got to I, I don't I don't know where this is, how this got this way. Is 17 please, excuse me, please identify yourself for the record first. Say that again. Please identify yourself, your name. And Caputo. Thank you. Thank you. The, on the left side of the garage, 
the smallest side facing the street, the, set, the dimensions are 17 feet to the end of the garage. On the other side of the garage, they are 31 feet exactly by survey. There's nothing dubious or unclear about that. Those are exact dimensions. We have been assured that 25 feet is the setback on the front of the, uh, from the road back. We have started the garage 27 and a half feet from the front of the garage. Now, Mrs. Moody said she wanted to hear from the computer something about a massive hole that looks like the Grand Canyon. When you bring a backhoe in and you start making a hole, it looks like a mess. It's 13 by 10. That's what it is. It's not any more massive than that. But those dimensions are exact. I don't want you to feel that, that there's nothing exact in here. David was asked to do a volume and square footage count of the addition. That's why he didn't have these numbers right in front of me. I have a survey and a report that I submitted to Mr. Smith that shows the exact dimensions of the front of that house. The setbacks are not unclear. And Mr. Caputo, do you have the dimensions of the garage as it is The garage is now? 22 feet by 30 feet. 22 feet wide by 30 feet long. And what was the setback from the left-hand side of the what, garage? The shortest feet? side is 17 feet to the tip of the garage. The other side is 31 feet. 31 exactly? Yes, those are exact dimensions. Yeah. On your site plan, it says 32. Say that again? On your site plan, it says 32. Who put that on the site plan? I don't know. It's can I clarify something? Uh, Mr. Smith, can you clarify this? Yes, I'd like Proposed to. Proposed structure was issued at 27 feet from the front property line to the nearest point of the proposed structure. Um, Mrs. Armstrong is right that there's a 30 set foot setback in the shoreland zone that you can't take advantage of the reduced setback to 25 feet uh, only unless it's outside of the shoreland zone on a non-conforming lot. But the does, ordinance does allow that the front yard setback can be set back or may, can be reduced on roads that are not classified arterial to the average setback of two principal structures fronting on the same road in closest proximity to the site of the proposed structure, but any structure must be at least 20 feet. The two structures that are closest proximity, in my interpretation, of this ordinance and any other ordinance I've worked with that has it had this position is that that it's on on the same side of the road. The theory being that if you've got five dwellings existing that are all 20 feet or 22 feet, that that person can take advantage and have an even strip of houses at the same distance from the property. I believe that's the reason why, even though it doesn't say on the same side of the road, my interpretation on the same road, which means that there are two houses, one at approximately 22 feet and the other at 18 feet, which would allow them to reduce down to 20 feet and, and hence the building permit is still legal in that 27 feet is more than the average of the two houses on the same road in close proximity. What is, provision of the ordinance? It's under, under um, page 56, under the RA district. Minimum setbacks. Well, like the, um, let me make sure I understood what you're saying, Bruce. Um, so you can make an, you can approve a variance from the front line setback without the zoning board having to approve it. I cannot approve a variance. I can approve a building permit reduced to the average of the two two principal okay. buildings in closest proximity to the to the uh, applicant applicant's lot. But if, if there is a setback with the proposed structure that uh, impinges on the 30-foot setback, doesn't that have to finally be approved by the zoning board? No. If you, if That's you, what I'm confused if about. If you read page 56, it's clear that the setback, the legal setback, is the average of the two co uh, houses in closest proximity to, to, to the applicant's proposed site, proposed addition. Are you looking under the new new ordinance? 55. I mean, not that there's any difference, but the page number may be different. Page 55. The old one. 
Um, Mr. Smith, could you clarify the 27 feet? I'm not sure what you're referring to. The, the site map that we have. If you look on the building permit application on the proposed structure front setback. So 27 feet from this proposed workshop to, this, to the property correct. line. That's what you're talking about. Okay. That's, Thank you. So it's a setback reduction, but that, that does not have to be approved by the zoning board. It's not a setback reduction. It's the front yard setback should it meet. It, it varies depending on the, if, if both built both buildings were 25 feet, the average of that would be 25 feet, and, be, and the applicant would be restricted to 25 feet. But you have to take and add those two up and divide by two to come out with with what the minimum yard setback, front yard setback is. That's an allowance under the RA district. Okay, I, it's um, beyond my legal expertise, but I, I read the front yard setback set forth below may be reduced only on roads which are not classified as real. To me, that's setback reduction, which would Well, you can call it what you like. The ordinance allows the average to be the setback for the front. And maybe the town attorney can clarify yeah. that. But. I think the front of that sentence is beyond the comma where it says, um, to the average setback of the two principal structures. That's what he was talking about, right. taking the average right. of the two. Right. And which structures did you use for that determination? The two just prior to that. Two houses prior to that? Correct. Okay. And their measurements again were? 22 and 18. So you take if the you go up the road uh, and you and you you continue <coughs> Lawson Road to serve that, that services the two houses beyond it, which is Armstrong's and the one on the other side. Both of them are, are less than the 27 feet, also. So, um, I mean, I guess that's a matter of interpretation that, that um, could be challenged. I guess. Mm -hmm. 20, you said 22 and 18 feet. The ordinance says that any structure must be at least 20 feet. Right, but it's still the average of the two principal, but it can't be less than 20 feet. So in other words, if you had two that was 18 oh, feet, it still could have, it would have to be at least 20 feet. Mm -hmm. So the, the most most the setback will allow was a 20 foot setback. Can I take you the board goes too far down this road? Because I think there's some real factual um, and, and other legal issues, and I just talk about this in my case in chief. I can wait, but I don't want the board to think that this a uh, simple black and white matter because Mr. Smith totally misstates the or misinterprets. Okay. Well, um, you're not speaking in, in the microphone now, so that, that isn't on the record. And I, I will like, would like to give you a chance to come and, and um, add information to that. But Mr. Caputo still has the floor, and we'd this, like this to give a, him the opportunity, and then we'll come back if to you it. You can help if you could excuse me for a few minutes. So tell, don't get emotional. I've got my life involved in this house. I've got lawyers here. I've got another lawyer who's married to a lawyer, whose brother's a lawyer. God knows how many other lawyers in the family. And we're all sitting here discussing what is a person to do that comes to your fair town, that gets an architect, that gets a lawyer, that buys a set of plans, that comes to a code enforcer, that gets a permit, and that gets a sale over and over and over again. It seems like we're going to meet here every three months. I mean, what is he to do? Madam Where Chair. law have I violated that I'm going through this again? I think we need to Thank stick you. to the points. And well, we the point is that you have three lawyers discussing the niceties of what's right and wrong. I'm not a lawyer. And, and if, you, if they have the, all this argument, how, what is the citizen that comes to my house supposed to do? He hires a lawyer. He hires an architect. He comes to your code enforcement and goes through the procedure. What does he do then? Is his only point, right excuse to me, himself? Excuse me. This is not addressing the points at issue here. We would like I mean, to. I don't want to hear that. But what, Mr. Caputo, like, um, please. Mr. Mr. Pistacci, um, this is there. There is in the American democracy. There's always an appeal process, and that's what we're in the process of. It's a wonderful um, process. Um, okay. Are there? Is there any other information that you that you no, can bring no to us at this to time? Give you other than to tell you that I followed every procedure I was told to follow, and I'm back here again. Right. And I probably will be back here again and again and again, because well, I have a conglomerate against me here. I'm like a mom and papa running against the AMP. That's all I have to say. It doesn't matter. The, we um, sometimes democracy can have its frustrations, but what we hope to do tonight is um, none of these issues are black and white, and we hope to get as clear as we can on the legalities of this and to be able to move on. Um, is um, Mr. McVeigh? Would you like to? 
Yeah. And, and I'm sure Ms. Armstrong is all primed and ready for this, but I might as well just give the board what the legal issue is. The ordinance that you're looking at now talks about averaging the uh, setback on the uh, same, the, the houses on the same street. Well, it doesn't say which side of the street. That's the issue. The word side is not in that ordinance. That's the legal issue. The question is, is it appropriate for the code enforcement officer in the town to interpret that ordinance the way it is always interpreted, which is you look at the houses on the same side of the street to make that average, or do you have to look at Ms. Armstrong's house, which is across the street? And that's the legal issue. I, don't, I can't tell you what the law court's going to tell you how to interpret that ordinance. Uh, but I can tell you that it appears that the town has been interpreting that as taking the uh, same side of the street as a common sense application. Uh, uh, although it is a question of law, some deference is given to the way the town interprets its own ordinances, and I would encourage the, uh, the board to, to interpret that ordinance the way it has been applied in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, um, uh, do you have a question of Mr. McVeigh? I have a no, question, no. Why don't you stay at the podium? No, no I don't have a question. You don't. I have a question for our, our uh, attorney. Okay. Section 19-4-4B1A states that after January 1, 89, any portion of the built structure that, um, that does not meet the required setback from the normal high water line of a water uh, or a water body or wetland up edge, upland edge. That portion of the structure shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30 percent during the lifetime of the structure. Can we get an interpretation as to what we're talking about? Are we talking the whole structure or that portion that is in violation? For example, if we're talking this garage, and I asked to, to get an idea of how many square feet, uh, probably about 15 or 20 minutes ago, how many square feet is in violation or in the wetland area or the um, uh, sure uh, land zoning area? Is it 30% of that or is it 30% of the whole garage that we're considering? Um, and that's only an example. I'm not saying the garage is, is the only issue or it's the house or whatever. I'm just asking, is it 30% is it of half the garage based on this diagram? Or is it 30% of the full garage? Okay. <laughs> any, any portion of a structure, if any portion of a structure does not meet the required setback from the normal high water line, uh, uh, normal, yeah, normal high water line of water body or wetland upland edge, that portion of the structure, so the portion of the structure that does not meet the required setback from the normal high water line, shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure. If you had a, a building that was uh, one foot in violation of a 75 foot setback, you could not, and, and let's say that was uh, 10, 10, feet, uh, 10 feet wide, so you have 10 feet by one one feet, so 10 square feet, uh, is in violation. You could expand that portion that's in violation of the setback by three feet, if my math is right, 30% of, of, of the 10, 10 feet. You could expand the rest of the structure that is in conformity by, you know, as long as it meets the other setback requirements of, of, uh, of the district in which you're located, but there wouldn't be a 30% prohibition on the rest of, of that structure. That's the way I read that. Okay, that's... Is it, it says that portion of the structure, again, referencing the, the portion of the structure that does not meet the required setback, that portion shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30 percent. Thank you very much. That answers my question. Is that the same uh, understanding? Yes, you I, had for I'd like a point of clarification, though. You're talking about the garage. The garage is attached to But wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I, I'm going to have to say this, Bruce, only because that you're kind of a defendant on this. So I would like to, and, and if I'm out of order, if I'm out of order, correct me. He would then be basically in the audience, is that correct? And not up here volunteering information? We've been through the. Correct me. Correct me. No, Mike. Our, our can he allow he, him to be sitting up here. Yeah, he, he, okay, but can he chime in at any time? Well, I ask for a point of clarification. The, uh, yeah, yeah. He, he asks, asks for uh, uh, to be recognized by the chair. That's perfectly appropriate. As other people would need to be recognized by the chair. Okay, I just wanted that clarified. So. Was that your question? No, I have a question for David Lloyd going back again some time ago before we went off. Um, what part of the garage is in the 75-foot area? What are the dimensions of the garage that's in the 75-foot area? Because that's the portion, as right. Mr. Hill just described. I, that's I can't stand here tonight. And, and, I mean, I have to, like, I have submitted documents established by your code enforcement officer to show a line going through the garage. It's approximately 12 feet in. It's probably an approximately 2,000 cubic feet of volume in there. Uh, that can be, I mean, I can very easily do that. I, I don't have an exact figure standing here tonight, though. I, I would ask Mr. Smith, do you have any more accurate um, dimensions to, to answer, that would answer this question? My point of clarification that I was trying to make, Madam Chair, is that I consider that one structure because it's, it's, a, it's a dwelling with a breezeway and a garage, all under, all continues. Therefore, the calculations are based on the full square footage and volume, and therefore the 30% expansion is based on that portion of that full structure within the 75-foot setback. That's probably why Mr. Lloyd can't answer your question by singling out the garage as a separate entity, because it's not a separate entity. Yes, Was it not attached, then yes, I would say that it would be 30% of the garage could be added on separate, and that, that those figures would be available. But it's total volume and square footage within 75 foot at of, one of structure. That, of that portion that was on the other everything, side of that line. Everything, right. right, everything within 75 feet of that structure, that includes the main dwelling, the breezeway, and the garage. His calculations was based on that, and that's probably why he can't single out the garage. Oh, no, this is, I, I have a correction to make there, though. All the calculations are based on how, every piece of a house within the 75-foot mark. I didn't include the garage in the calculations, so if I throw the garage into these calculations, it will increase the amount of volume we can expand and the amount of square footage we can expand. Those, those numbers are not in these, because originally we were just, we were just working on the house. The, the workshop became sort of incidental, so I didn't go back and revisit that. But I, I mean, I can say that it's within the criteria, but I can't give you an exact number. But, so all the calculations you have in front of you are only what is within the 75-foot mark on the house proper, not including the garage. Let me fast forward a minute. I'm looking at the garage as a detached garage. The way I saw it, the way I visualized it, all right? And that's why I specifically asked it. The board is going to have to determine whether it's a detached garage or whether it's an attached garage. It's an issue that, that uh, can be brought up. I think it should be brought up. And I think it's an important issue, and that's why I asked for, for the dimensions of that portion of the garage. That's uh, well, that would change, 70. obviously, the calculations, okay. because if it's being viewed separately, that, that would change the criteria, and that would have to be looked at. And so I can't stand here tonight and say it works within that criteria. You know? Now, that's, that's why I, it is I feel as though it's important. Physically, it's attached. By what means? There's a, uh, basically a, a connecting walkway, a roof, which is open to the weather, but it's a roof connector that goes from the garage to the house. And the there floor. is a four-foot cross wall across that bruise. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you restate that? There is a four-foot cross wall that, that, that's, that's across that bruise. So it's a foundation that's carried out through. Could you clarify, is there a frost wall? 
under the house, under the breezeway, under the garage? There's full foundation on the house, cross wall, and, and yeah. under the breezeway and garage. Okay. Bruce, did you say under the breezeway to the garage or under the breezeway and the garage? Under the breezeway and garage. It's attached with a four foot cross wall, continuous from the house over the whole portion of the garage. The reason, you know, I, I, I need to make a, another point here that, that the calculations, as they get close to 30%, have to be real accurate. But if something is so far off from that point, which in my interpretation it is, that those figures aren't as critical to get exactly if you're talking 9 or 10 or 12%. Um, not to say that, that, that these aren't accurate, I'm just saying that if we were getting close to that number or if they come back next year with something that's going to bring it up, then, then we really need to finalize some figures right down to, to, the, to the square inch. Um, but that it isn't as critical until, until, until we really get close to the 30. We're, we're way, a ways, in my interpretation, we're a ways off from having that being a concern that it does meet the 30 percent rule. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions at this time? Are there, are there any other um, speakers that would oppose this appeal? Um, there's, there's an appeal which Julie Armstrong presented, and there's then the, how would you, how would you put it, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Caputo's um, position. My uh, name is Richard Russell. I'm a uh, concerned citizen, I guess. I live at uh, 11 Tides Edge Road, which is the next road up from Lawson Road. Uh, the Caputo's house is 500 feet, 300 feet to my right. I'm also a builder, and it, it concerns me in that uh, you seem to be talking about cubic footage, and yet the thing about setbacks, and as a builder and having built houses in Cape Elizabeth, um, that you just arbitrarily say, well, you know, we're going to go over the setback a little bit in the front towards the shoreline. Now, I've been brought before this board before because I had a piece of gutter stuck 10 inches over a uh, side setback out in Broad Cove. And we had to get a variance for a piece of gutter like that. And uh, to me, that's the most important thing. And also this thing about sort of dumbing down the uh, setback on the roadside, just because all the other houses are back, not in compliance, that therefore we can sort of throw away the, uh, the spirit of the law, which is um, trying to have this new conformity where the houses don't come up within five or ten feet of the lot line. And I just wish someone would address that and try to explain to me, you know, how they can just sort of, without going through the, uh, without getting an appeal, that it can just sort of be, uh, you know, the, the code enforcement officer can just say, well, it's only a couple feet over, a little bit closer to the water. I mean, it seems to me that that line is becoming less important than the back line, which is on the street. And yet the one on the street, well, we can average that down because all the other houses don't conform. And it just seems uh, that's not the spirit of the, you know, these regulations that have been crammed down my throat for the last 30 years. And uh, I just wish that would be addressed. I mean, I could care less about the cubic footage or the, you know, what it, I just like to see some more importance given to this setback rule. And, you know, these rules are put down, I, you know, where's this hardship stuff? That's, that's the stuff we want to show us hardship and we can maybe give you a range of a variance. Not well, you know, everybody else is doing it, so let's move it down from 30 feet down to average it out and it comes out 25 feet or 22 feet. Thank you. Thank you for, for making those points. Our, our job as the Zoning Board of Appeals is to use the regulations and the ordinance that, that is in place and to scrutinize it for, to make sure it's been properly applied. And when there, is an op when there is a case to be made for making an appeal, 
to scrutinize those to see if it meets the criteria. There are, there are always times with, um, with these kinds of ordinances where um, the board has the opportunity to make a recommendation to the town council for amendments of those. But what we're trying to do now is to look at the proper interpretation of it to assure that that's been made or to, to ask if there are some others. At, at this time, I'd like to ask, is there anyone else who uh, hasn't yet um, testified that would like to in this hearing? Um, Ms. Armstrong, you did have, you did ask um, very politely, I might add, <laughs> if you could come back, and I, I, I'm sure that you've made a note to be able to come back to that point, and if there are any others that you'd like to address at this point, I'd ask you to do that. Yes, I have a few, and I will start with that one because it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, if you look at the ordinance where it talks about reducing the road, the front yard setback on the road, it says a couple of things which uh, fly in the face of, of Mr. Smith's interpretation. It says, to the average setback of the two principal structures fronting on the same road, and that's the first key, the same road, in closest proximity to the site of the proposed structure. So it is the two principal structures that are in closest proximity to the location of the proposed structure. There is nothing about being on the same side of the road. The plain language of that is that, and again, you need to, you need to strictly construe, we are talking about the shoreland zone here. Uh, the plain language is that you look at the dwelling or the structure that is closest to the structure that you're building. And I haven't been out with a, there with a tape measure, but it's pretty obvious to me that that is the Aronson home uh, on one side of the Caputo property and our home across the street. The other issue on, that I pointed out about being on the same road is that um, there are other houses, there is a house on the other side of, of Mr. Caputo's that has no street frontage. It is on a private way. Now, the um, street frontage of our home, again, I don't know how much it is, but it's got to be, and I'm not very good with distances, but it, it must be 40, 50 feet. It's, it's a substantial distance from Lawson Road to our structure. So if you look at the plain meaning, the plain language of this exception in reducing the street setback, this does not meet that reduction. 30-foot provision does apply. Okay. People look confused. Is, is there something else I could say about that? And if someone has a question, I'd be happy to answer that before I go on to my other. I, I would like to ask at this point if Mr. Hill could, could comment on that. I don't know if historically this issue has come before the board on the interpretation of this part of the ordinance. Um, Mr. Smith spoke earlier about using his his customary mode is to do on the same side of the street i think around where she has two front setbacks and therefore the side of her house is less than the 27 feet and even averaged in using that it still would come out so that caputo's could do it at 27 feet whether it be hers or the one across the street so we still have four places no matter how we interpret this because that is private way is considered a street. It may change its name or it may change its status, but it's still a road that goes by and continues on. That's I, I I'm one that needs to visualize it. I, I'm I got lost a little bit, but but it does say you take the average setback of the two principal structures fronting on the same road. And as I understand it uh, Mr. Caputo's uh, property fronts on Lawson Road. So I think you take a look at the two uh, principal structures fronting on Lawson Road that are in the closest proximity to the Caputo's property. It, uh, Ms. Armstrong is right that it doesn't say that it has to be on the same side of the road. Uh, 
just says fronting on the same road. I think that that's probably within the uh, board's discretion to determine whether fronting on the same road uh, would mean on the same side of the road or uh, on the same road. I, I think it could be interpreted either way. Um, I think re reasonable lines could differ on that. But um, it doesn't say that it has to be on the same side of the road. Yeah. It just says on the same road in closest proximity to the site of the proposed structure. Right. And in any event, it has to be at least 20. And my point being that if you even take the ones on the other side of the road, that that Lawson Road continues mm -hmm. and stops, and there are two houses on either side that are in close proximity, that would be less than 27 feet. So I think we're there either way. That's my interpretation. I, I think you'd want to, I think, well, I think the board would want to have those measurements to, mm -hmm. to make sure that it was 27. And I, w I would ask, Mr. Smith, do you have those measurements? Well, no, I don't, because um, I measured the two prior to that, because okay. I thought that was sufficient, because it's been my interpretation the three years I've been here, that, that the same side is a long, logical, common sense approach, because the theory is to keep some uniformity and allow some uniformity. Mm -hmm. If you had, if you use the ones on the other side of the road and they were both 50 feet away and, and the, the two on either side was 55 feet away, but they were only 20 feet, then, then the theory behind what this is trying to accomplish, uniformity on the same side, that's my interpretation, okay. would be thrown Thank out the you. window. Thank you. Chris, to the, the um do both of those houses on either side of the computers have a Lawson Road address? Um, I'm not sure. I guess somebody could answer that probably. Yeah. Uh, someone talked about <coughs> visualization. You need not have to visualize. Use your imagination because Exhibit 12 has a plot plan of the entire neighborhood. And comes in handy. That's our exhibit 12. And you can see where Lawson Road ends. It ends at a circle in front of our home. And beyond that is a private way. Now, it may or may not, I don't know whether Mr. Smith is right that a private way is classified as a street, but it really doesn't matter. It's not the same street. It's not Lawson Road. It is a private road. So. The, uh, clearly, that would not apply. We're talking about the structures on the same road, have to be lost on road. Um, the, the only difference is, if you look in front of our, um, if you look at the circle, and then you look above the circle, uh, and there's a, a, a square footage uh, number 13040, that's the next lot down that I guess looks like it's lot 36, that actually is part is half, half belongs to our home and half belongs to Rita Yarnold's home, which is on the other side. So that's all one lot, it's long since been one lot. And the, to the extent that the private way gets close to our, closer to our home, um, that's our side setback. Our front setback from the street is quite large. Ms. Armstrong, yes. is the Caputo's home on lot 10 or 12 on this? It's 12 map? and 10. 10 and Those 12. Those also have been merged. Oh. And so the homes on Lawson Road that are the closest to his home are the is a home that uh, lives on lot 13 and 14, which is also merged. And uh, our home, it, the, the home on lot seven may be, I'm not sure, I can't tell by looking at whether it's a little closer to the Caputo home, but it is not, it does not have frontage on Lawson Road. It fronts only on the private way. So that would not fall within the language of the ordinance on uh, fronting the same 
Mr. McVeigh, uh, I think is willing to yeah, I make a change here. I want to volunteer that this is a pretty abstruse issue, and I've got to tell you, for three feet, we're willing to give it up. Uh, so I want to move this part because this is obviously a, a pretty close question, and uh, we can live without the three feet. So. Could, you, could you clarify what you're, what you're proposing to move? Well, the, the, uh, instead of going to the 27, we'll go to the 30. A 30 foot setback. 30 foot setback on the, uh, the uh, front, the front setback. Okay. So I got that Thank one right? You. David? Yeah, okay. Ms. Armstrong? Okay. And again, I'm not sure how that will change the numbers if, if the expansion is staying the same size and just being moved, it's going to throw more of it into the setback area. Uh, Mr. Lloyd said something about 12 feet. That, what makes it difficult is that the, Mr. Smith determined that the normal high water line is at the seawall, pretty much up to the corner of the garage. And, and at the corner of the dwelling, he determined that it was 16 feet out. And from those points, there's a line that goes from the seawall out 16 feet. So that, so the, the Noel High water line angles out, so obviously 75 feet in from where Mr. Smith determined the normal High water line angles out. That makes it complicated. Certainly moving it is complicated. And what I suggested is when you throw in the basement issue, which this board has never addressed, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, as Mr. Smith does, that they are not over 30%. And I, have, I still haven't seen them with the hard numbers to demonstrate that they're not over the 30%. Um, I think I missed saying when I started out that all of the applicants um, ha live in property that looks over 31 Lawson Road at the ocean and all of the applicants' views would be diminished by the expansion in question. Um, Crosby versus Town of Belgrade, I'm not sure I've seen that case, but when you're talking about issue preclusion as to whether or not you can, the board can look at an issue again, there are a couple of critical elements. One is that the decision be final. Something under appeal is not final. So I would say that, that um, collateral estoppel, issue estoppel and issue preclusion uh, don't apply. And then the other thing is, that it has to be part of, it has to be essential to the determination of a matter. Well, where the normal high water line is from the corner of the house to the garage was not an issue in the last hearing. So as far as I'm concerned, that issue is the location of that normal high water line is up for grabs. And frankly, I would be very interested in hearing Mr. Smith discuss why he angled it out the way he did and what his justification for that uh, was. Um, we believe that if the town council in adopting the shoreland provisions meant or they intended that the provision, no, you can't build anything that's, that's any more nonconforming or that, you, that your addition has to be no more nonconforming, only meant you can't go any closer to the water than you already are. They would have said that. They could have said that. It would be very easy to say. They didn't say that. I think they meant more than that. And I think we owe it to the residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth to give effect to that language. It is impossible to, to suggest that something that increases a building footprint at the shore and covers more shoreline doesn't increase the nonconformity. And last time, the board was concerned about giving effect to the 30% provision. Well, we would suggest that if, if you don't accept our argument we made last time, in this case, there is a very uh, strong uh, interpretation that you can give to the 30% provision, which is that you can go up, but not increase the footprint. Um, and that would give effect to that provision, and it would give effect 
uh, to the provision that it can't be any more nonconforming. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was uh, Mr. Hill or someone, uh, Mr. McVeigh, excuse me, said that there should be some deference to the town in terms of interpreting its ordinance, and that's not true. The courts have uniformly held that interpretation of an ordinance is a matter of law. It's interpreted by the court exactly uh, as it should be interpreted by the board and so on. And that's all I have. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions of Ms. Armstrong while she is at the podium? Mr. Backer. If you, I, I take you at your word that you gave us the argument last time, but forgive me for having forgotten what it was. Tell us again what your argument was in the 30%, what you think the 30% means, in how you justify the two provisions of the ordinance that appear to be inconsistent with each other. Um, are you asking about my argument that no expansion is allowed, which is grievance one, or the or grievance two, which is that it prohibits expanding the footprint. Well, what do you think where the ordinance says shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30%? Mm -hmm. What do you think that's referring to? I think it's referring to floor area or volume, which can, be, can both be increased without increasing the building footprint. Okay, my, my, let me just by go back and say- By adding another floor or right. going up. Right. Or down. Yes. Now, I believe that based on the Lewis case, that 30% provision may actually have no meaning. It may be, it may be illegal, and if and that the primary concern of the ordinance is seen as as not increasing the nonconformity, and the court in Lewis told us what that meant: meant increasing volume and square footage within the setback area, you can't build anything, okay? I understand this board has, has rejected that argument. I've asked you to reconsider. I don't realistically assume you're gonna do that tonight. But I think if you don't buy that, you've got to buy the fact that you can't increase the building footprint. That that was really intended for people to put a dormer on a cape uh, or to um, put a partial second floor, partial third floor on um, a home that existed. Um, it wasn't meant to, to take up, uh, to allow them to increase the footprint of their structure at the shore. And we're talking 75 feet of the shore. From the shore is a very, very short distance. It's a strikingly small distance if you actually get out and measure and look at where that is. We're not talking about a lot of area. And so I don't think the drafters could have intended uh, that increasing the footprint wouldn't increase the nonconformity of the structure. Ms. Armstrong, may I, may I ask, I'm, I'm confused by your line of argument there because the section on enlargement under nonconforming buildings and structures after it says that the portion of the structure shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure, it goes on to say that construction or enlargement of a foundation beneath an existing structure shall not be considered an expansion of the structure, provided that, and it goes on to give the provisions. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm perplexed by your line of argument. It specifically says in the ordinance that there can be an enlargement of a foundation. Not an enlargement of foundation. It says it doesn't go beyond the footprint, I believe. It does not use footprint language. It well, it doesn't go beyond the, the, foundation. the structure. That, I believe what that means is that the found replacement of an existing foundation under an existing home shall not be cut, considered part of the expansion. If, the, if, it, if it comes to the board and they determine that, that, it, that the building can meet the uh, setbacks of the greatest practical stand, it's not an increase in foundation. It, it, is, it is what she says it is. It's an increase. It's only replacement 
or the existing foundation mm. or the area of the existing okay. dwelling. It, and it says, that the, and only if, and one of the criteria is that the completed foundation does not extend beyond the exterior dimensions of the structure. Okay. So in other words, they're not increasing the footprint. That is, if uh, a, a home were built on a crawl space, such as ours is, and we wanted to put a basement in, that would be something that might be allowed. Or if you needed to uh, increase it for, for um, some kind of flooding problems or whatever, and you were going to add some. I think that's what that speaks to. Um, Mr. Hill, can, can you clarify? I, I have another question about that. It is under the section that talks about non-conforming buildings and enlargement. Um, and, but the, the preamble to that, and I'm talking about on page 38, Article 4, B1, says that a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit from the CEO, provided that such addition or expansion doesn't increase the non-conformity. Is this an irrelevant um, section that I'm looking at? No, I don't think it's irrelevant. I, if, if I can just address the part about the new foundation, this board um, addressed this with the Two Lights Lobster Shack a few years ago, where they had, the, the structure was on, um, a portion of it was on posts, and they wanted to put in a foundation. And they didn't go any farther than existing. And they, they were allowed to put in a foundation underneath the existing structure. There were other issues in that case, too. They wanted to use that, that space, and the board determined that was an expansion of a non-conforming use. But they were allowed to put in the foundation underneath that building that was within 75 feet of a normal high water line. Um, the way I read 1944B1 uh, enlargement, uh, it, it specifically allows expansions uh, for non-conforming structures and then goes on to define which ones, what expansions will be allow and that it, it talks about the 30 percent increase uh, it also says that no structure which this is in B no structure which fails to meet the required setback from the normal high water line shall be expanded toward the water body tributary tributary stream or wetland so it does say you can't go any closer than than what you already have um, so you're limited, you can't go any closer, and you can't expand more than 30% uh, floor area or volume of that portion of the structure, which is in violation of the setback. So it's different than the Lewis versus uh, Rockport case because the setback provision that was discussed in that case just simply said you can't have an expansion which increases the nonconformity of the structure, period. It, it didn't go on to modify what expansions, expansions would be allowed. It just said you can't increase the nonconformity of the structure, period. And so that's what, in my opinion, distinguishes the ordinance that we're dealing with here, which clearly allows expansions of nonconforming structures, and the ordinance in uh, the Rockport case, which said you can't increase the nonconformity. And the difference is that we have different ordinances? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, it, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm perplexed by your statement that it says that you, if I hear you right, you're saying that you read this to say that you can increase the nonconformity? Well, yes. I mean, you're, if, According to the Lewis case, any increase in the volume that is in violation of a setback increases the nonconformity of the structure. That previously to the Lewis case was not how that uh, terminology had been interpreted. But um, our ordinance has a specific provision as to how you can increase a non-conforming structure. And that goes into that uh, B1A with the 30% expansion. I wish I could say I understood what you just told me. 
But what do you think it means where it says, provided that such addition or expansion does not increase the nonconformity of the structure? If it ended right there, you couldn't do anything. I don't, I don't believe you could do anything within the 75-foot setback. Then the, the, in order, you have to, when you're interpreting an ordinance, you have to try to give effect to each provision of the ordinance. And you can't read uh, a provision of the ordinance in such a way that will make nonsense of what follows it. And this, if, if, if it ended that provided such addition or expansion does not increase the nonconformity of the structure, we would have been done an hour and a half ago. But it doesn't end there. And it goes on to explain what expansions will be allowed under the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance. And any portion of a structure which does not meet the required setback from the normal high water line, that portion shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30%. So it specifically allows an expansion of a structure that doesn't meet the setback. And you think that includes the expansion of the footprint? As long as B is met, that no structure which fails to meet the required setback from the normal high water line, yet no structure shall be expanded toward the water body. So you look at this and determine whether you think it's an expansion toward the water body. Mike, um, yeah. I just have the same question that David asked, and I'm, I'm just going to almost repeat it in a different way. Um, I'll give you the same answer. But, but given, given, that, given that preface, that they provided such addition or expansion does not increase the nonconformity, and then goes on to the 30% thing, I mean, I, one way I could interpret that would be that it prohibits a footprint expansion, but provides for an area of volume expansion. That's the only way I can see those two conditions being met. I think that's a reason. I think that would be a reasonable interpretation of it. I think you could, you could decide that you can't increase the footprint. That that you could decide that. But I, I think it would also be reasonable for the board to say you can increase the footprint so long as it doesn't go any closer, which, which is what B says. But you can't go any closer. It would increase the nonconformity. And the only way I can reconcile those two yeah. things is to prohibit. An increase of the footprint uh, where it increases nonconformity. That's an option. I think that uh, that would be a reasonable interpretation of it, that if it's within the 75 feet. You, you, could, you could make that call. I've been struggling with this all night. That's Madam, yeah. Madam Chair, could I have a floor at some point? Yes, you can. I, I think I also see Mr. McVeigh um, struggling to come. You, you can't do it until you come to the podium, but we're going to give you a, a chance in a moment. Um, <laughs> um, Mr. Smith and then Mr. McVeigh. Um, and then Ms. As, as, as I showed you from the picture of the show, main state shoreline zoning guidelines, they created the minimum guidelines, which is the identical language that's in our ordinance. The intention, therefore, I believe the intention of the state was to allow a footprint expansion. expansion. From, from my standpoint, working with four towns, this very same language appeared in all four ordinances that I worked with. The court officers prior to my coming in and after I came in have all interpreted footprint expansion being allowed under the 30 percent expansion because the state who created language and told us that that's what we had to adopt well, we could be more restrictive um, have, have, already, have already determined what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, I can also tell you from practical experience that surrounding towns uh, have interpreted it the same way if I, as I have. Um, I just wanted to share that information with the board. That's helpful. And what we will be doing is passing this back for people to take another look at. And, and this I is the argument that, that, that we made at the last meeting, and I thought this was, this was a, a, a done issue, but I, I should have copied this uh, page for your it's enjoyment. Fine. Okay, Mr. Hill. And that was, that was always our office's interpretation of, of this ordinance and the shoreland uh, zone that was mandated by the state. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that that, uh, that booklet is helpful and, and gives a couple of pictures and visualizes what types of expansions were allowed. 
when I when I said to, in response to Mr. Keneally's point, though, um, you don't have to always uh, agree with what I say, and I think that reasonable minds could differ on it, and you you could make that uh, decision. I, I think that would be a, a reasonable decision. I'm not saying it's the only reasonable. I understand. Okay. I understand. Good. Um, Mr. McVeigh? I just want to offer a legal point. Because the question, the question is how could we make sense of this ordinance? Uh, you know, what does not increasing the nonconformity mean? And the question is, well, expanding the put, footprint would have to increase the nonconformity, not according to the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance. Mr. Hill pointed out that what the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance does is say, what we mean is we don't want you to go take the building any closer to the water. And Mr. Smith's interpretation is that, and the state's interpretation is, that means you could take a nonconforming structure, and as long as you, it's got an existing setback, and as long as you don't go beyond that, you're okay. But if you go up to it and it stands sideways, and you're within the 30%, you're not increasing the nonconformity, because the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance has said, how are we going to define increasing the nonconformity? I'll tell you how we're going to define it. If you go closer to the water, you're increasing the nonconformity. It doesn't say that. Well, it says uh, it, the does, it doesn't say it doesn't not say that either. It's a question of interpretation. I'm giving you another interpretation that, that the ordinance allows a sideways expansion up to the setback line. And that's what the language no closer to the water is, is designed to accomplish. It does say that in B too. That's my argument. Yeah. So anyway, that, I think that is another way of interpreting the statute. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Ms. Armstrong? Uh, for starters, about the um, guidelines of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, I'm not sure that we're looking at the same document. I did not know until tonight that this board had that document at the last hearing. So um, I'm not sure if we're looking at the same document. I have seen one that is um, issued by the Maine DEP and is dated October 1996. And the first paragraph, it says, if your community's locally adopted shoreland zoning ordinance has more restrictive standards, those more restrictive standards, more restrictive provisions apply. Now, I think there's no question that at least in some respects, the Cape Elizabeth ordinance is more restrictive than the state minimum. And in, in which way? Well, for example, in the definition of the normal high water line, the state is much more restrictive and says that we're not going to look at the flat high tide it's going to be much further inland than that. Um, so there's no question that Cape Elizabeth wanted to provide greater protection for its shoreline than the state would require. Uh, the second thing is the language, and I don't have it in front of me, in the state law that these guidelines were uh, designed to interpret uh, is different. And it, it could very well be interpreted differently. Um, it it talks about, um, well, if, if you give me one moment, I actually have it right here. In Title 38, Section 439A4, the way they talk about the nonconformity, it's at the end of the paragraph, and then it says, as long as the expansion does not create further nonconformity with the water setback requirements. That's very different language from Cape Elizabeth ordinance, which says, so long as you don't increase the nonconformity. And I think it is more capable of an interpretation that that means you can't go any closer to the water than you already are than the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance, which says you can't increase the nonconformity. The other thing is that uh, Mr. Hill stood here and said that it is one plausible interpretation of Cape's ordinance that you can't increase the footprint. And I submit to you that if that's a plausible interpretation of the ordinance, that's the interpretation you need to adopt because in terms of increasing the, uh, or not increasing the nonconformity, you are required to liberally construe that. That means you need to exclude um, whatever building that you can plausibly uh, support 
by an interpretation of that language. So you can't just pick one that fits. You have to pick the one that is the strictest. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, um, um, Mr. Hill? Mr. Keneally has a question. Could you comment on that, that we, sh we are bound to rely on the strictest plausible interpretation? Uh, Ms. Uh, Armstrong does correctly uh, cite some of the case law that deals with nonconformity. The general rule is you would uh, construe an ordinance so as to restrict the increase in a uh, nonconforming structure. Um, I think it, you'd have to look at the, you look at the plain meaning of the ordinance. If you feel that there is uh, an ambiguity and there are two options, if you feel there is an ambiguity and two options, you do have to pick the more restrictive option, the one with a, uh, not allow as, as much of an increase. It, it gets, I get tongue-tied because of double negatives, but uh, you pick the one that is more restrictive. I think that that's accurate. As long as you, if you found that it, the plain meaning of it was you could increase the um, foundation as long as it didn't go any closer toward the water, and that's the plain meaning of it, you can't make it more restrictive than the plain meaning of the ordinance. That, Make sense? Yeah, although I think we've, we've agreed, I think, that there isn't agreement on a plain meaning. Yeah. And, and that, um, so I, if, if you have two interpretations of it in your mind, you have to pick the one that's more restrictive. If you don't think there's any question on it, because the plain meaning of it is mm -hmm. you can't go any closer, you can expand it, but you, as long as you don't uh, go any closer to well, the Well, I'm going to try to press you a little harder on this, because sure. We, we have different plain meaning interpretations on the board. We probably have three or four of them at this present time. Yeah. Um, you've identified each of them as plausible. And what um, Mrs. Armstrong has said would be that the Shoreland zone, Zoning Enforcement, we have to go with the strictest plausible one. So we may have four plausible ones here. Or you call them plain, I'll call them plausible. Uh, and when I'm asking you to comment on whether or not we that really is our position, that if we have four plausible interpretations yes. identified, yeah. that we should act on the most strict. That's, I think that's an accurate statement of the law. But what, I, I, what I'm saying is, though, uh, you may think that it's, obviously you don't personally, but a, a board member might think the plain meeting allows an expansion so long as it doesn't go closer to the water. If you felt that that was a plain meeting and there was no question in your mind, then that's the, that's the interpretation you should... Well, that's what we're relying on you for some advice on here. What's, what's, what's plausible? Well, I can't tell you how to vote, if you, but I, I can tell you that if you have in your mind uh, two plausible or four plausible interpretations of this, you have to pick the one that's the most restrictive. I can't tell you how to vote. No, I understand that. But are you telling me that if Joe has a pl uh, an interpretation that's plausible, it differs from mine, I can say that's not plausible and discard it as a, consider as a, as a possibility in my consideration. See what I'm saying? I missed that point. If, if, you don't, if you don't think that Joe's interpretation is plausible... I don't, no, no. What I'm saying is if I, if I personally don't agree with one other member's interpretation, does that allow me to discard it as not plausible in my yeah. consideration? Yeah. Okay. Allow or require? If you don't think that an interpretation that another board member has offered is plausible, then if I, if I understand the question correctly, then you can disregard that. No, but, I'm, but that is, and as our counsel, you've said that oh. we have two plausible alternatives, and so we can ignore your advice, your identification yes. of this is plausible. Right. Go whatever way we want. That's right. Okay. But if you think it's plausible, you have to pick the one that's more restrictive. Well, the night is young. Um, <laughs> Are there, are there any other questions 
from board members or shall are we ready to close the hearing? I would interpret that then that we're ready to close the hearing and have some discussion on the board. Who would like to start? Should we start by making a list of the things that we have to decide? That's an excellent place That's to start. Point. Do we have to decide whether the garage is a separate structure? I think in square footage that was discussed and offered that uh, if we use the the garage as a separate structure, uh, it would be somewhere in the vicinity of 25% increase. So I don't think that it's that important to determine whether it's detached or not. That was not an issue. That was, it was a question that I brought up uh, and hasn't been an issue uh, unless someone wants to challenge us and, and uh, in taking that route, but um, it's still on the 25 percent. Oh, it's also canceled out by the fact that it's connected with that four foot truck. Can we, uh, getting back to David's question, can we just look at the appellant's grievances one by one and, and discuss them one by one and vote on them? Let's, let's try that as an approach. So the first one is the proposed addition would increase the non-conforming square footage and volume of the structures within 75 feet of the normal high water line, thereby increasing the non-conformity in violation of sites those. This is something that we've already voted on. The last time this was up. Can you speak into the mic? I think this is something that we've already voted on, ruled upon, and if the Crosby case, as Attorney Hill has pointed out, applies, I think our logic and holding would be hold true for this also. Yeah, I, I, um, I would agree with that, that based on our last consideration of this appellant's grievances that um, We've already made decisions that more or less respond immediately to grievance number one. Is there anyone that feels differently about that? It, it, and for the sake of discussion, we'll, um, we're not going to vote at the moment, but we're going to take these one by one. Um, most people. It, it, no one disagrees with the point that was just made. Um, so let's move on to number two, which is the proposed addition to the structure would increase the footprint of the structure within 75 feet of the normal high water line, thereby increasing the nonconformity of the structure in violation of section 1944B1 and 38 MRSA 439A4. And this is the issue we were just discussing. I don't think that the normal high water line is a point of discussion since we already decided that in the last meeting. Um, I am very uncertain about how to interpret this, um, this footprint issue. And I'm inclined to is going towards the most conservative interpretation of it. <coughs> Struggling with it for a half hours. Mm -hmm. This is a time when we could discuss differences of interpretation of that section. In the past, I think the board has interpreted uh, squaring out a uh, an irregular shape um, would not constitute uh, expanding the nonconformity of the building. 
uh, on page 35, I think there's examples of, of where they've added to an irregular shape um, and uh, have not uh, increased the nonconformity or, or further gone outside the setback. Yes, a portion of the building has gone into the, the nonconformity area, but it's not gone greater than what's already existing there. And I can't remember the last case that we saw one before us. Uh, I do know a couple of, of uh, several years ago, uh, but I don't think any board members were, were present at that time. May I, may I interrupt, um, Madam Chair? Certainly. The illustrations on page 35, I just want to point out that those have to do with nonconformity outside of the of the shoreline zone. And the, those illustrations are not um, applicable for this because we're dealing in within the shoreline zone. Okay. Other thoughts on this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a thought, not necessarily an answer. Um, I have to acknowledge that I was persuaded by Ms. Armstrong that her interpretation of this was correct, that you cannot increase the footprint. However, then I became concerned when Mr. Hill started talking about subparagraph B. Uh, when he directed our attention to that, that says no structure which fails to meet the required setback in the normal high water line shall be expanded toward the water body, suggesting that you can expand away from the water body by increasing the footprint. And I'm wondering how you could possibly, it, well, if one of the obligations of statutory construction is to try and harmonize all the provisions so that none of them are left meaningless, then we have to try and figure out how, what paragraph B means in the context of paragraph A. So if B says you can't expand toward the water body, the inference is that you can expand as long as you're not going toward the water body. So if we're building onto the side of the garage rather than on the water body side of the garage, um, we seem to be within paragraph B that says we're not expanding toward the water body. Um, which would argue in favor of an interpretation that says you can increase the footprint as long as you don't do it toward the water body. And I think if we take the position, and I want some help from Mr. Hill on this if I'm thinking the wrong way. If we take the position that you cannot increase the footprint at all, what does paragraph B mean? Are we rendering that meaningless? Which would leave us with an interpretation that isn't consistent with the rules of statutory construction if we're supposed to try and interpret in a way that they all have some meaning. Otherwise, we have to throw up our hands and say, there's no way it can be interpreted and we're just going to cast one of these paragraphs out. And I'm not sure, and I think that there is a way for us to interpret that doesn't require that we cast anything out. You're asking about an implied meaning here, then, rather than explicit meaning. That's right. I think the explicit meaning is very confusing. Um, I think we're trying to piece this together like a jigsaw puzzle in a way that there's a picture that makes sense for us. Mr. Uh, Hill? B may apply to a situation where you have a structure that is entirely within the 75-foot setback and you're expanding that portion of the structure that is away from the water. That, that might be a, an interpretation that... Uh, 
That's confusing because it starts out by saying that no structure which fails to meet the required setback. Yeah. So if you had an, a, a structure that was entirely within a 75 foot setback and they wanted to expand, um, put on an addition that part of it was within the 75 foot um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I'm just going to draw a structure that if this is the water line and this is the 75 foot setback and the entire structure is within the 75 foot structure uh, setback and they want to put on an addition on the back end of the property uh, building and a portion of it's within the 75 foot and then the rest of it's outside of the 75 foot. I mean, that that may, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a... Uh, Actually, that may make some sense because B says no structure, whereas paragraph A refers to any portion of a structure. Right. That makes, that's, that's a reasonable interpretation to me which takes me back arguing in favor of Ms. Armstrong's interpretation, which is you can't increase the footprint. Another, another suggestion might be about uh, a cantilevered uh, portion of a structure. So it wouldn't increase the footprint, but the structure would, B would prevent you from putting cantilevered uh, toward the water. I would, I, would, I would read it that way. No structure which fails to meet the required setback. So if you were within 75 feet, you couldn't put on a cantilevered addition toward the water. Would anybody else like to offer an interpretation on the board? Are we then convinced by the um, by Ms. Armstrong's arguments and by Mr. Backer's and Mr. Finneley's? I'm not arguing. I'm waiting to hear some <laughs> divergent opinion. It's different from what we've heard. Yeah. I'm struggling with it. However, that having been said, <laughs> that, that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm buying Ms. Armstrong's argument on that, this book, the, the Maine Shoreland Zoning, a handbook for shoreland owners, this is, has a publication date of October 1998. It has an illustration in here that would seem to suggest that you can increase the footprint within the setback, but, but that's even going towards the water, though. Well, actually, no. It's extending a porch that's already that's intruding. But there is a disclaimer in the front of this that says this handbook is for informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for the law. For specific information about your local shoreland zoning ordinance provisions, refer to your, your municipal ordinance. That's very helpful. <laughs> so I'm not willing to accept what is in here as an answer to our question. I think Jack may have been taking it in the right direction, is that if there are multiple interpretations to it, it I think the intent is you, you try to go with the stricter of, of the intentions, or the, the stricter of the options. Mm -hmm. And where um, it, it's certainly 
there, it's certainly open to interpretation. I think that we um, we need to go with the stricter of the two. Is there anyone that feels differently? I'm swayed as well. Procedurally, we need to go through all, all of these. Um, number three is that since the 31 Lawson Road property has already been expanded more than 30% in volume, when the appropriate normal high water line is used and the volume of the basement is not counted towards existing volume, any further expansion is prohibited. This also is an issue that we, were, we have decided in the last time this came before us, and I think it's an issue before the Superior Court, and I would suggest that we uh, refer back to our original decision and adhere to that. Mm -hmm. I agree. We all in agreement on that one? Yes. Okay. Number four, the Caputos have not demonstrated that the proposed addition would not result in an increase in volume of 30% or more over the life of the structure even when using the normal high water line erroneously established by Code Enforcement Officer Smith, thereby violating Section 1944B1A and 38MRSA 439A4. I think the same thing applies. Yeah. Yeah, just think Could you speak into the mic? And I think the same it. thing applies. It just said that we've decided that issue at our last visitation of this um, or similar grievances. Well, and we also have the letter presented to us tonight from uh, David Lloyd. That, if I'm reading it correctly, establishes that the total expansion um, is less than 30%. Okay. Even accepting the lower level to be a basement. Okay. So we're all in agreement that that one wouldn't. Right. Um, number five, um, Code Enforcement Officer Smith has not required the applicants to demonstrate that their proposal is in conformity with the shoreland zoning provisions of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance and state law. I think that's uh, almost accusatory. I think Code Enforcement Officer Smith has done an excellent job trying to provide the applicants the best of his ability to demonstrate that their proposals in conformity. I disagree with that assertion. I would also add that he's been very forthright in bringing forth information, whether it be for either side. Um, and any of the um, decisions he's made up until, until now have been well backed with documentation. I agree. Is there anybody that feels differently? Okay. Um, we then, um, I believe that it would be helpful for us to, we've just done a straw poll, but officially to vote on each one of these grievances separately and then take it as a whole in terms of a motion. Mm -hmm. So I would entertain it. Um, Motions on each of those five of how we should handle them. I would move that the board reject Collins grievance number one on the basis that the definition of the normal high water line was resolved by the board at a previous meeting and makes this grievance uh, repetitious, one that's already been decided. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? In favor of rejecting it? Oh, it's six. Is there another motion on number two? Um, I'll make this motion. Um, I move that we um, accept um, grievance number two as 
uh, being a correct statement, and that is that the proposed addition to the structure would increase the footprint of the structure within 75 feet of the normal high water line, thereby increasing the nonconformity of the structure in violation of section 19-4-4B1 and 38 MRSA section 439A4. Is there a second to that? I second it. Any further discussion? All in favor of accepting? I, I, can you hold your hands up for a minute? I see five. All opposed? One. Okay. Um, is there a motion on number three? I would move that we reject appellant's grievance number three. The grievance is based on trying to define a normal high water line uh, different from a definition that's already been accepted by the board at a previous meeting. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? 6-0. Motion on number four. For a motion from somebody on number four? Um, I'll, I'll move that um, we reject uh, grievance number four um, that says the Caputos have not demonstrated that the proposed addition would not result in an increase in volume of 30 percent or more over the life of the structure, even when using the normal high water mark erroneously established by CEO Smith, thereby violating section 1944B1A and 38 MRSA section. 439A4. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? 6 0. And on number 5. I'd like to move that we emphatically reject Helen's grievance number 5 on the basis that Code Enforcement Officer Smith has required the applicants, has required the applicants to demonstrate that their proposal is in conformity with the Shoreline Zoning provisions of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance and state law to the best of his ability and very diligently. Is there a second on that? I second it. Okay, thank you. And is there a further discussion on that? All in favor? Six. Um, opposed, zero. Okay. Well. On the basis of this, then, we've accepted uh, the grievance number two, which means that at this time it would be in order to have a motion regarding the entire appeal. Um, I move that we approve the administrative appeal of Anthony Armstrong, Julie Armstrong, Kimberly Moody, and Rita Yarnold, um, appealing from the decision of the Cape Elizabeth Code Enforcement Officer granting a permit on May 12, 2000, and later amended to Daniel and Diane Caputo of Cumberland for their property at 31 Lawson Road on the basis that the building permit violates the zoning ordinance of Cape Elizabeth on the basis of the fact that the proposed addition to the structure would increase the footprint of the structure within 75 feet of the normal high water line thereby increasing the nonconformity of the structure in violation of section 19-4-4B1 and 38 MRSA section 439A4. We've had a motion. Is there a second? I second the motion. Is there further discussion on the motion? 
There being none, all in favor? Uh, could you keep your hands up for a moment? Uh, that's five, all opposed? Five to one. Okay. Um, this concludes um, this part of this evening's business um, where we have approved the appeal. Thank you all for your participation and your patience. I am right now. I was hoping I stay. Yeah. I did it an hour 40 minutes. Right, so an hour 40 minutes. Get my sister. Sleep. <laughs> so, what do you do? Sunrise shots? Fog shots? Yeah, this morning we did a lot of fog shots. So, we did a little shake in the sky. Yeah. Hi, thank you. What? Um, this, the book. The book. that book? Thank you. Yeah. Not the next one. You were right. You were right. I was. I was trying to push you to make that decision first. But you kind of did. Does anybody, does anybody need my kill for the just the, kind of oh, yeah. the yeah. only one that was here was the If we have to stay, don't you? <laughs> he gets paid for it. <laughs> we did. Yeah, no, I get to buy no, order one. Can we need somebody else to nominate David? Oh, okay. We'll find somebody. It's okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks. What's the important thing? Okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Uh, yeah. What are we totally intrigued, sir. Okay. Madam Chairman, can I uh, thank you for your excuse from uh, Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice drive. Well, um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, before proceeding, as an observer in the previous proceeding, I commend the board for its fairness, impartiality, and professionalism in the conductance of the last hearing. I'm very proud of the board. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was about Thanks to say. Thanks for sticking through it, Bob. <laughs> yeah. We wondered for a moment whether we would get you back. Or, unfortunately, we do have to, to lose one board member who who needs to travel for another two hours before um, uh, for, for a work assignment um, very early in the morning. Um, and But we appreciate his being able to stay. We're fortunate to regain our other board member, Mr. Cronin. Um, and Mr. Mr. Hill is no longer with us, so he won't benefit from his interpretations. Um, but I would like to now move on to the third the third uh, and final uh, piece of new business, and then there will be several um, communications that we will either be able to address relatively quickly or we can table till the next meeting. Um, I'd like to uh, invite, uh, for actually this, to introduce this, this is to hear the variance appeal of Donald Held, Head and Karen Zand at 1237 Sawyer Road, tax map R05, lot 56A, to expand their existing dwelling within the 250 feet resource, 250 foot resource protection one buffer by 40% floor area or volume as allowed with the Zoning Board of Appeals approval under Article 4, Section 194-5A5. And I would first ask, 
excuse me, ask uh, Mr. Smith to um, give us just a, a quick um, recap of the actions that have been taken on, on this case to date. And excuse me, Bruce, before you start, as I indicated before, I am going to excuse myself from this proceeding oh, yeah. uh, because I have, uh, our, my office has an ongoing relationship with, uh, with Mr. Head. He does a, a great job managing our retirement money and I have personally done legal work for him. Okay, so before, you, before you do any observe. further advocacy, we will <laughs> step to the, uh, <laughs> to the, uh, there. Um, but don't, don't go away because there are a couple of other business items which we'd appreciate your, your uh, participation with. Um, Mr. Smith? Uh, the subject property is uh, 1237 Shore Road owned by Donald Head. Sawyer Road. Excuse me? Sawyer Road. Sawyer Road. Oh, what would I say? Sure. <laughs> I guess I'm getting punchy. 1237 Short Sawyer Road, owned by Donald Head and Karen Zan. It's in a resource, um, it's in a residential A district, and it's overlaid, um, well, it's within 250 feet of a resource protection one, which means it's a critical wetland buffer. The ordinance allows them, uh, the code officer to allow an increase of 25% expansion of square footage within that 250 foot buffer. The ordinance also allows the board to look at the situation as a hardship and, and allow um, a, up to a 40% expansion. Uh, the project came before me and it was over the 40%. Uh, they in turn were told that they could approach the board and they scaled the project back down to under 40 um, and here, they're here, here to present a case uh, and prove hardship. Okay, thank you. And um, please introduce yourself uh, for the record and then present your case. Uh, my name is Don Head. I've been a Cape Elizabeth homeowner for uh, nearly 18 years now. Uh, I have with me tonight Craig Cooper of Rainbow Construction, who is our <coughs> contractor in this project. Frank Locker of PDT Architects, who is the designer of the uh, modernization we intend to make. Uh, my wife, Karen Zand, is unable to be here tonight because of a long planned visit to her father far away, and changing both our plane tickets was uh, prohibitive on a cost basis to get back here. Uh, so I must soldier on. Uh, 1237 Sawyer Road is an underground house. That uh, makes it uh, relative, I guess I'd say absolutely unique in, in town, although I did hear that there might be one in Scarborough somewhere. Uh, underground means this. This model uh, shows the house as it exists. Uh, the, uh, this is the south-facing glass wall. This is rock and earth. The house is tucked into rock and earth so that the all light comes from the south side, except that there's a very large uh, greenhouse right here, which is a huge uh, volume of structure, which of course does let light into the back side. This is a garage, which includes a, a, a spacious upstairs storage area that is uh, uh, well well fixed for uh, whatever you want to put there. But that, that is the entire structure. Uh, it was built in 1979. It was built uh, as an experiment, really. No one knew at that time the uh, life expectancy of uh, a roof membrane and so on that is buried under eight inches of dirt, which tends to get a little wet around here in the, in the winter particularly. Uh, no one knew the life expectancy of the drainage systems that are meant to, uh, uh, to carry away the water on that roof. Uh, for all these reasons, I confess I was very leery about buying this house in the first place. Uh, my wife fell in love with the property. I fell in love with the property uh, later on as well. It is a beautiful spot. Uh, but the reasons I was leery uh, have come home to roost. The uh, property now does suffer from increasing problems with leakage, uh, with uh, dampness in the summertime and uh, increasingly in the wintertime. There are a whole series of photographs in the uh, package we gave you 
that shows first how uh, idyllic it looks from the outside, but second how it is deteriorating on the inside, which uh, goes to the uh, economic hearts of this whole thing. Uh, the house is, in fact, uh, uh, going to deteriorate if we don't uh, improve the structure. Uh, I will say that one of the reasons I was convinced to buy it in the first place, almost exactly five years ago, we closed in this house uh, five years ago uh, Friday. Uh, one of the reasons I was induced to buy it is that the price kept coming down. This house was on the market for four years. Uh, we looked at it in the early summer 94 and bought it in mid-summer 95, and the price was coming down in between. Uh, we knew then that if we bought it right, we probably would not be able to sell it ever, <laughs> unless we did something to uh, modernize the structure, which of course is why we're here before you tonight. Uh, we have a design which will remove the problem that's causing the deterioration by simply building a more conventional looking structure with a more conventional looking roof line on top. Uh, uh, take away the, uh, uh, re replace the volume of the uh, atrium greenhouse there, replace the uh, dirt on the roof with a, with a building that extends out from that very large garage, following that same kind of line for a minute, like this, right? Yeah. Uh, you have all this in, uh, in elevations in your material as well, but since uh, Mr. Locker has so uh, nicely built this model, we thought we might as well show it to you. Uh, It's important to note uh, several things about this. That uh, uh, first, as you look from the at the, uh, the large site map in your packet as well, it's important to note that this is in the roughly the center of a eight or nine acre piece of property. That uh, this property can be seen by only one resident of Cape Elizabeth, who is Eleanor Redmond, who is right here tonight. Uh, she is the only neighbor on our road. Uh, there's only one spot that the house can be seen, and that is from way out at the end of uh, a Sawyer where it S's into uh, 77 in Scarborough. It's important to note that we are not increasing the footprint in any way, nor are we increasing the height. The uh, existing garage ridgeline remains the tallest part of the entire building. Uh, we do have uh, uh, letters in your packet from uh, our abutters that uh, say they are look with favor on this project. There are a total of four abutters. You have letters from three of them in your packet. Here is uh, a letter from the fourth. So, uh, uh, in sum, we face a deteriorating situation because of an experimental design that uh, has simply worked for a long, long time and now it is ceasing to work. We have a, a ready means of correcting the problem and, uh, and creating a house that is much more in keeping with the uh, neighborhood area as it is. And we need only your approval to allow us to go forward. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sorry. I'm concerned I'm always first asking the questions. I get kicked around pretty good sometimes. What is on the other eight acres, uh, the other, the rest of the eight acres? Uh, woods and trees. Wood. The, the eight acres does extend uh, uh, down the hill. This house sits, uh, uh, roughly 70 vertical feet above the marsh. I think there are uh, elevation lines on the uh, on the site map that you have there. Uh, we're about. Uh, I also marked on the site map uh, the plan, plan of land. How it's labeled, plan of land. Uh, the distances from all four of our property lines that the house sits, and all those distances are covered with uh, uh, rocks and trees and woods trying to get an idea of why the house was placed there back, what, 20 years ago, 18 years ago? How old is the structure? 21 years, I think. 21. Okay, I'm just trying to get an idea of 
why it was placed where it was or where it is? Uh, at that time, of course, uh, there was no such thing as this uh, these resource protection uh, uh, setback. And uh, it appears to me that it was placed there because that's where the uh, view is most comfortable. Okay. I get, uh, Eleanor, do you have any uh, thoughts? Is that fair? Yeah, that, that's, that's another good point. That it was uh, the house as originally designed was uh, intended to be make heavy use of solar heat, so there had to be a, 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 a spot where you were facing absolutely straight south. And that is the uh, that is the impact here. Uh, you note that the, the facade is even is curved, so it picks up the winter sun as it comes around. So south facing uh, towards the view line is the most important consideration. Would it be practical to relocate the house to make meet the setbacks? Relocate the house? Mm. Well, the house is substantially a hole in the ground. Mm. Uh, Pretty good trick. So well, I would say no, it's not practical. Uh, you mentioned there's a lot of deterioration in the house. Obviously, that's going to be removed. Just well, uh, uh, it can be stopped if we can change the source of the deterioration, which is which is weather from outside. Which is what you're attempting to do. Right. What I'm trying to do is uh, expand on the the difficult the hardship aspect of this, mm -hmm. the difficulty. Uh, I'm Craig, Craig Cooper of Rainbow Construction. In, in regards to your question, um, Joe, the, the financial hardship would be tremendous to relocate the house as opposed to uh, the addition upon the uh, existing books. I actually installed the kitchen in the original house in 1979 for the, for the former uh, owner, the original owner of the home. And uh, it's structurally built into the side of a rock hill because of the underground original intention. We go back to the 1970s and the energy crisis here. We started building and using triple glazed windows and super insulated houses and some people were out there building uh, underground houses in an attempt where all of those uh, factors that we, we no longer are using triple glazing, we found that super insulated double walled houses cause bad air quality inside and, uh, and poor breathing uh, ability and stuff. And this uh, application is a similar format with a, with a rubber roof under uh, 12 inches of insulation in soil, not allowing it to breathe. Um, and so the removal of that rubber roof and building on top of it is one of the ways of eliminating the problem and the better air quality, as well as bringing living space, the, the bedroom, and et cetera, upstairs. Uh, and, and is far less expensive than literally in the, uh, totally demolishing the house and moving it uh, completely from there, which would be a tremendous hardship, I would think. Uh, and, and feasible in that regard. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Mr. Head, I have a I have a question. When when we grant a variance, four conditions have to be met, and you did give us some written um, information and interpretation um, in response to those. And I'd like to have you expand on your response to the the fourth condition that must be met, which is the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Could you respond to that in more detail than... Yes, in our written. response to uh, why the hardship is not the result of action by us or the prior owner, uh, there, there are two directions we are trying to go there. Uh, one is that uh, at that time, there was no way for anyone to have foreknowledge that such a, a uh, law as we're now discussing would exist. So therefore, there was no earthly reason to believe that you could not fiddle with it if you had to uh, as time went by and as systems wore out. Uh, secondly, uh, the state of the art in designing such a house, in designing an underground house with dirt on the roof, was incomplete at that time. And there was uh, no way to have uh, foreknowledge that uh, 
as, as to when systems would wear out and how they would wear out. Certainly everything uh, has a lifespan. Uh, if you had a, a conventional shingle roof on a conventional house, eventually it would wear out and you'd put another roof on. Uh, and that <coughs> certainly wear and tear of that nature would be part of this kind of a house as well. But there was no way to know uh, when that might happen. So uh, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the question implies, uh, I implicit in the statement, why the hardship is not the result of action taken, implies uh, almost a negligence kind of a concept. And uh, uh, that is certainly not the case. It was simply that the state of the art had not advanced enough to know when things would change and wear out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions of Mr. Head? Are there, is there anyone else wishing to speak in favor of this variance request? Is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition? In favor? You were dozing. <laughs> less than four minutes here. I just want to reiterate a little bit what Bruce bring and, and add to the process that, that we went through to get to this, that the that your um, bylaws do allow uh, the ability to expand 25% of square footage and or volume, whichever is more restrictive, within this 250-foot setback. In which case, had we met that criteria, Bruce would have been able to issue us a building permit, and we would not be here before you this evening. As it turns out, by the very nature of the underground house here, it's interesting that we you know, we did meet the 25% square footage rule. This ad proposed addition is only is, is in the neighborhood of 25% of square footage expansion, but it is the volume rule because there was no roof over the underground house that could be counted as volume. Had this been a conventional house with a, with a roof instead of a flat roof and had some volume on it, we wouldn't even be, be, be here before you today. So it's a catch-22 for the homeowner here that we even have to apply for this variance because uh, um, we are, in, when we're talking this 40%, it is not by accident, as Bruce mentioned. We've changed the style here that we're asking for 39.97% in our calculations. We worked backwards into that 40% number, excuse me, to, and, and made the addition slightly smaller to meet the volume criteria that is asked by the, uh, that we're doing with the volume. And I've uh, heard you've been hearing about footprint and square footage and increasing all night long. So I wanted you to know that we were way lower on the, you know, we're in that 25% area on square footage of increase here, and it is the 40% increase of volume only is why we have the buoyancy. I'm confused because at least by the appearance of it, and I haven't looked at the maps from this way, it, 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 um, it looks like it's covering the same area. It's actually um, smaller. The, the, there's lines outside and on the back side. Here. So the lines on the outside are what's underground? This, 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 more underground than what okay, this, this, this total piece is what's under the ground. Uh, I see. This is, uh, okay. Because you would have, you've had to essentially set back the house to meet the requirement. As well as all of this. And remember, uh, and, and remember that uh, uh, there is volume being displaced as well. Uh, that, that, that's a huge chunk of Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, thank you. Just, just for further clarification, and we went through this the last three hours, I think it was, you are not expanding the footprint of the building? We are not. We are uh, uh, within the uh, existing footprint uh, marketly. Uh, yes. We've commented how we've uh, sh shrunk the upper floor. And, uh, and it's important to note, for what it's worth, uh, that we're not increasing the height either. Although, since there are no there are no abutters who can see this house either before or after from their own houses, that may be a moot point. Uh, the, uh, well, I, I could uh, 
in order to uh, uh, continue to explain the hardship issue, I, I didn't realize I didn't refer to the, uh, the ant problem. Uh, Sterling's been working on it with us for five years on this thing, and they just can't get at it as long as all that dirt is on the roof. So we've come to the situation this summer where we quite literally have uh, carpenter ants dropping out of the ceiling uh, many times during the day, which is a little unsettling, too. No pun intended. <laughs> Talk about hardship. <laughs> <laughs> you live in Cape Lizzo, you're going to have all carpenter ants, I'm sorry. Everybody is. <laughs> I was going to ask for advice on that myself, but another time. Um, <laughs> any other questions of Mr. Head? Is there anybody else wishing to speak, or we will, at this point, uh, close the hearing? Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll now have um, turn to the board for some discussion, um, particularly around um, this is a, this is a variance decision that requires meeting the four conditions of hardship. I think it would be helpful for us to to expedite the discussion by by uh, by discussing these these four conditions. Somebody like to start? Well, the applicant didn't go into the specifics about the purchase price of the house. But I imagine with this condition, right now, he would have a very difficult time selling the house, um, especially you know, everything he's known and the disclosures required. So just under number one, I think that he probably would have a hard time getting what he paid for it, whatever that was five years ago. Um, even though it's a good market now, it's only one. I question whether he could get a reasonable return in the condition. It sounds like it's been and appears from the pictures. And I think adding to that is, uh, as was brought up earlier, I don't. I think it would be very costly to try to start a, a whole new structure someplace else on the property. Well, I, I don't think he, he can't couldn't do that. He'd have to be in 250 feet for each. He'd have to be set back 250 feet. Yeah. So there's no place. It, is there any place on the uh, the land that he can build? He could build. Well, I'm sure on eight acres it's probably high, but. Mm -hmm. For the dimension, okay, it, it, it's 180 feet from this fairway forever. So it would have to be 73 feet for at the back. Is it 180 feet? That's what the paper says. The map says. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what this map says. That's a different permit altogether. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion on this one? Do we, um, what, why don't we see if we can take a vote on each one as we go through, mm -hmm. rather than um, mm -hmm. looking at them all together. Somebody like to make a motion on this? I'll make a motion that um, the land in question cannot yield a um, reasonable return unless a variance is granted. I second the motion. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Say we have, we're down to five here, yeah. five zero. I, th I think the uh, need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, but certainly the location of the property uh, at this particular time. Anybody that feels differently about that one? Would you like to put it in the form of a motion? I thought I did. I'm Seconded. <laughs> Thank you. I move. I move. Okay. I move the need <laughs> is due to the unique sure, circumstances of the property, not the general conditions of the neighborhood. Yeah, okay. And there's I a motion and a second. Discussion? Any further discussion? No. Uh, did we oh. go? No, we I'm haven't sorry. voted yet. Oh. <laughs> You're real fast. All in favor? Yeah, it's 11. Okay, five, uh, five zero. And I will move that the granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. Seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Five zero. And lastly, I, uh, the hardship, I move that the hardship is not the result uh, of action taken by the applicant or the prior owner, but instead I, I concur with what he's saying, that it's definitely the, the changing of the uh, zoning ordinance at this, since, the, since the construction of the house. Second. Any further discussion? We sort of added a little discussion there, but that's, that's fine. All in favor? Five zero. Okay. Um, now we need an overall motion. You're on a roll. I move that the um, request for variance be given to Donald Head and Karen Zahn for the um, 
Do we have the to strict application of the zoning ordinance requirement section 19-4-5 based on the facts and conclusions established. Just a second. Just a point of information. Do we have to specify the setback distances that we're giving him a variance to Bruce? There's no setback. No. Five. Setback isn't an issue. It's just size. Well, it's no change of the footprint. Yeah. I see a, a, on the application it says setback, yeah. Yeah, and the final report will will say, talk about the 25 maximum and the 40 percent. It's, okay. it's written there. Okay, um, is there any further discussion? All in favor? Five. It says in all opposed, zero. Okay. Um, there you have your variance granted. Nicely <laughs> done. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I want to thank you for your services and certainly this evening, this being your last meeting, uh, you did an outstanding job based on the problems that uh, we encountered. Wish you well. Miss you. We do have um, a couple of pieces of, of new business um, we do? to deal with related to this. I'm uh, sorry, oh, we do. No, we, no um, we need to do that. I'd like uh, to let me find this. A couple of things. We we can make a decision. We have there are two um, two issues of communications that are here, and there's a third piece of business related to my resignation and um, voting in of a new chair, which I think um, at least that one um, we may be able to do very quickly. But on number one, discussion of June seven letter from Mike Hill um, would. Would uh, people like to discuss it now or defer it till the next meeting? Defer. Defer, defer the next meeting, yes. Is there anybody that would like to keep us here? All right, we're going to defer that. And um, discussion of the cover page that accompanies the applications, we can defer that, I would I would think. Does anybody yes. object to deferring it? Okay, and the, the third item is that, um, for, the, for the information of the board, is that um, this is my last meeting. I am resigning because of taking a new position, which will keep me out of town on weeknights. Um, it's a new position I'm very excited about, but it, it does mean that I have to make some hard choices. And so I guess I would like to um, thank all of you, first of all, for being a great board, especially tonight, and, um, <laughs> and hanging, hanging in there with um, some, um, it was really quite an experience to, I've always felt that with every board meeting that it's quite an experience to go through um, how we, how we um, grapple with interpretation of, of the ordinance. And I want to thank all of you, particularly for tonight, but also for, for my um, year and a half tenure on the board of the town as well. Well, um, thank you, Madam Chair. We'll miss you. You've done a good job. Thank you. Uh, I, I would say that just when you get the hang of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> I certainly felt that uh, this is a, there's, there's a learning curve to the, to the new board members. I would say there's definitely a learning curve, and I know Joe and Bob would um, <laughs> say yes, indeed. A, um, that's why we're, we're not interested in each other again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and um, also, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank Bruce Smith for his uh, for your professionalism um, in presenting fact to this board. Um, very, very helpful, and you know, I think it's a difficult job, and I want to thank you for it publicly. And I think all the all the board, particularly tonight. Uh, felt that very strongly, that they appreciated your professionalism through uh, a difficult uh, case. And uh, um, continue to, the board will continue to rely on, on that. So I think things will go well for the future. Um, we do have the, um, since, since after this meeting I will no longer be chair, it would be helpful to have an election tonight for a new chair. And um, I, I know that there's at least one um, person on the board that's interested in the position, but we could enter, I would entertain nominations for um, anybody who would like to nominate someone else or even self-nominate. Nominate David Bagger. Second. Okay, in the discussion phase, we have to check to see if you uh, accept this nomination. Oh, I'm just a little concerned about how quick they both did that. <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a clear indication to me yes. that it has it, nothing to do with the clock, <laughs> but rather that they know something about this that I don't. Not yet, but you will. <laughs> you experienced it tonight, but two hours, three hours. 
how many hours? Yeah. Um, Can you say lightning be, round? <laughs> to be fair with the process, are there any other nominations from the floor or the, the board, actually? I move nominations, cease. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, then, um, then we'll close nominations. And um, all in favor of David Becker as the new chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals <laughs> enthusiastically <laughs> vote. It'll and, be fine. And uh, that'll be five, uh, and I assume with one abstention. And, um, I did abstain. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'll vote against. <laughs> um, I'd like to congratulate you on your election. I, um, and uh, I, you know, I, it's been a pleasure serving with you, and I know you'll do a great job. Thank you. <laughs> you leave your phone number. <laughs> Great. So, uh, good night, everybody, and thanks for hanging in. We are now adjourned.